fifth meeting of the Regional Transportation Commission. Can I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Sandy Brown. Here. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Montesino. Here. Commissioner Hernandez is not here yet. Commission Alternate Schifrin. Here. Commissioner Koenig. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Here. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Here. Commissioner Pegler. Here. Commissioner Rotkin. Here. And Commissioner Ryder. Here. Great. Uh, we'll move on to item two, consideration of any AB 2449 just cause and emergency circumstances requests. I believe we have none. Okay. We'll move on to item three, additions or deletions to consent or regular agendas. We have uh, posted to our website an add-on item for item 18, the staff report for item 20, and handouts for item 29 and 30. Thank you. A uh, review of items to be discussed in closed session. We have a conference with labor negotiators. Do I need to add any other detail than that? Okay. Session. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, do we have any public comment on our closed session before we recess to said closed session? Seeing none, uh, we will now go into our closed session and we will return as soon as we are done. Thank you. to return to our open session and we'll start with a report on items discussed in closed session. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. There was no reportable action from closed session. Thank you. We'll move on now to item eight, uh, approval of employment agreement between Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission and Sarah Christensen to serve as executive director of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll make the staff report on this item. Um, as the commission is is aware, um, after the resignation of the former executive director, the commission retained the firm of CPSHR to conduct a recruitment for the position of the executive director. Uh, CPH, CPSHR did conduct an extensive recruitment that led to an interview process. And um, following that interview process, the commission directed that uh, Ms. Derby of CPSHR and I bring back a staff report and a resolution agreement with the commission uh, to appoint Sarah Christensen as the next executive director of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. The contract that is before you today is a three-year contract. It provides for a starting annual salary of $255,200 per year. And in addition to that, um, uh, Sarah will receive under the terms of the contract, all of the benefits that are uh, presently provided to other management employees uh, within the organization. Her benefits are identified specifically in her contract, so she's not tied to any particular labor unit. She gets her own benefits um, pursuant to the terms of her contract. Her contract also provides uh, for termination without cause and termination for cause and voluntary resignation provisions, and it also provides a severance package that if the commission were to invoke that, uh, similar to your prior executive director contract provides for four months of severance pay and benefits during that time period. Um, the contract uh, is before you uh, today for action. There's a resolution in the packet, and I'm happy, happy to answer any questions that the commission may have about the terms of the contract. And following that, um, any questions the commission may have and public comments, then the appropriate uh, action would be to entertain a motion to approve the resolution authorizing the contract. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, we'll start with questions. Questions? No? Okay. With that, we'll go to public comment. Uh, if there's any member of the public that would like to comment on this item, now would be the time. And we'll start in chambers. Seeing none, we will go uh, to Zoom. Mr. Brian Peoples. Hi, this is uh, Brian Peoples from Trail Now. Um, I want to congratulate Christian, and this is a phenomenal um, decision by the board. We support it. Kristen is a phenomenal um, person, and uh, her experience with the Regional Transportation Commission really does benefit our community. 
Um, she actually, when um, Guy Preston was uh, hired, one of the main reasons um, Dick uh, said by the support commission was Guy knew how to get the project delivered. And that's really why he was hired. And I think Kristen has the exact characteristic. So thank you for with this initiative. Hiring Kristen, our TC executive director. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comments? There are no other hands up in on Zoom. Okay, we'll return to uh, comments in chambers. Thank you so much. Good morning, commissioners. Grace Blakesley of your staff. Um, today I'm speaking as an individual um, and not representing the, the court um, union negotiating group. But I wanted just to point out that as staff, um, the RTC work is incredibly rewarding and challenging. I'm grateful to serve as a public uh, to develop and implement this vision that you have for Santa Cruz County's Transportation Commission, especially for the most vulnerable and providing access to the jobs and housing and healthcare in particular. As a long range planner, I typically think 20 years ahead. When someone says 2024, I think that was a long time ago. I believe that is what it takes to bring forward the projects that RTC is implementing today. Your staff is constructing now the projects identified in Measure D, and at times get a lot of notoriety because dirt is being flung, new facilities are being built, and it's a very exciting time to bring these public benefits forward. But that work started a long time ago with planning and vision, collaboration, partnership with our part of all of our partner agencies and the support from this commission. Over the last six years, I've seen some talent lost at our agency and poor staff morale. Um, people have felt disempowered and there's been some lack of support for staff. I know later today on your agenda, you'll consider adding additional staff item, um, staff positions. And for that, I'm very grateful. I give a lot of credit to the staff that have remained for their commitment, their ingenuity, and their commitment to developing an equitable transportation system, given the politics that we navigate with alongside you. They are still ambitious and they are still motivated. As I mentioned, this planning work lays the foundation that led us to our sales tax measure. It's not uncommon for us to hear individuals take credit for that measure that passed. But in my opinion, it took our entire community working together including the staff, uh, the resiliency of the staff um, at the Regional Transportation Commission. Our agency is going through a lot of changes and having the new executive director will be a part of that. We're also um, undertaking this reorganization that you've also been considering. And in thinking about that, I'd like to ask that you consider a probationary period for the new director while the reorganization is implemented so that potentially new incoming positions can inform how to foster an engaging, productive, efficient, and comfortable environment for all staff. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment on this item? I see another hand up in Zoom, Chair. Okay, this will be our final public comment online. Lonnie? I thank you directors for the opportunity to speak on behalf of myself on equity transit. I just would like to say that because we are considering uh, an executive director with Grace Blake to have a period of consideration, especially because we need to look at adequate rail experience, given that we're considering rail in the future um, and currently um, in process. And if, um, as we look to hire a planner to replace the position that's going to be left open, I would also request that we find someone who has significant rail experience in addition to um, the other experiences that have been uh, met. Thank you so much for the time. Madam Chair, I'd just like to make a comment mm -hmm. about um, for making a motion uh, that I'm really excited to turn the page here and uh, new chapter with RTC with Ms. Christensen as uh, Kim as our executive director. Oh, yeah. 
Speak a little closer. As our executive director, um, I've learned to depend on uh, Ms. Christensen's uh, professional leadership as, as an engineer, and I've learned to depend on her presentations as being- Hey, we lost audio here on Zoom. Nope. Oh, thank you. We're gonna take a moment to address te technical issues. We're back? Okay. And we're back. Go ahead. All right, I don't know if I should start over again. I just wanna say that I'm excited to um, turn the page and uh, look at RTC, the new executive director in Ms. Christensen Kim is our ex executive director. She's been a consummate professional, I believe, in the years that she's been with, it, with us as our lead engineer. Uh, I've learned to depend on her presentations as being factual, transparent, and I could be uh, really depend on uh, a great s set of facts when she makes a presentation. I want to thank Sarah for her willingness to step into this role. Uh, it's not an easy one at this time, as we know, and to lead the reorganization of this commission, which is uh, itself uh, a real challenge to anybody who becomes the new executive director. Um, and I really want to say, give my full support for her to be our next executive director. I would like to make that motion that she be our next executive director for the terms that were, were announced. Thank you. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. Comments? Comments? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I do have a few comments and I'm, I'm making them with um, some concern. Uh, about doing so. I have been, uh, as an elected official, involved in multiple hires of um, executive management. And um, while I have um, had concerns, I have always voted yes, on ultimately, on those contracts. And I want to say that I really, uh, I think Sarah is a consummate professional. And um, I, I believe that she has um, excelled at project delivery, at, at working through some, you know, really challenging um, issues and during challenging times. Um, but my interest here is in uh, the health of this organization. And so I'm going to just say that I have concerns in, in the arena of um, Ms. Christensen's level of um, experience with supervision. Um, and I also have serious concerns about uh, the crossroads that we're at substantively in terms of where we're headed. And, um, and, and I, for me, the question is, do we want to be a highway organization or do we want to be a rail uh, organization or perhaps a combination? And I've supported, and I'll say more on that later, um, I've supported those compromises that um, this commission uh, agreed to and, and members of the public when we... Um, you know, when we ran the Measure D campaign, um, but I have seen uh, rail undermined uh, during my time here. I've seen it from commissioners and I've seen it uh, through the staff uh, kind of dynamics. And for that reason, I, you know, I can't support a three-year contract. I was willing to support a shorter term um, and with, you know, with no offense to you, Ms. Christensen, I, I feel that we need an executive director, as one of our public commenters said, who has um, real experience and an interest in um, really moving that project forward. So um, under the circumstances, I could support a shorter term uh, as an initial contract, but I'm not able to support a three-year contract, which is um, is not standard. I mean, it happens, but it's not standard for new hires, particularly when we see a person who's coming in without that director level experience. So um, I just wanted to be clear about my why I'm doing this. I do not take it lightly. I think a unanimous, unanimous vote would be important. I can't, I'm just not there today. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? Yes, please. I won't add anything to what Commissioner Brown, or Sandy Brown just said. I'm also going to vote no. Thank you. Yes, um, Commissioner Johnson and then Thank Commissioner you, Koenig. Okay. So um, I'm going to fully endorse and support this um, resolution. Um, you know, it's interesting that if you have a difference of opinion that you think that rail, the model has to prove itself uh, as being something that will work, 
that will be productive, that will be used. Lots of models out there and actual rails systems out there are failing. But I guess if you don't agree with um, certain people, uh, you're, quote, undermining the whole idea of rail. No, you're just asking hard questions that have to be asked because the people of this county are going to be asked to pay a lot of money. Point of order, I don't see how this relates to the item on the agenda. It is It is on the agenda because I'm talking about, I'm getting around to it, sir. Thank so, you. Um, I wish you'd show a little bit of decorum. It'd be nice. Um, so when somebody uh, complains that the uh, that that somebody doesn't have, quote have enough experience in rail and and that's the reason that they should be um, questioned. I have a problem with that. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Koenig. Sure, just a, a few brief comments. Um, so, uh, really, to underline the fact that we interviewed. Um, some very qualified candidates for this position, you know, we received over 100 applications for this position from across the state. And Sarah Christensen rose to the top for good reason. We interviewed a lot of people that did have uh, extensive experience in rail, but they're um, just did not match the level of understanding for our uh, unique situation here in Santa Cruz County, as well as also, I don't think had the strength of um, the interpersonal skills either. So, um, it's with uh, the utmost support that uh, I'll be voting for the motion, and um, I, I really think that Ms. Christensen, um, this is this is in no way related to um, any specific preference for one transportation mode or another. And I think, if anything, uh, one of the strengths of Ms. Christensen is um, our next executive director is that she's able to objectively consider uh, all transportation modes, and really a lot of the success we've had winning some really grand slam state grants have been uh, because of the multimodal approach um, that she's helped to champion. So, thanks. Thank you. Okay, um, I'll just say briefly, uh, congratulations, and we're looking forward to working with you. Um, Based on you know some of the comments we've heard, I think that uh, most of us can agree that there is no one solution to our transportation challenges here in the county. And I'm hopeful for the future under uh, Ms. Christensen's leadership that we will continue our focus on all opportunities available to us, including transit and rail and freeway projects and road improvement, um, as we would expect from any new executive director. With that, we have a motion and a second. Uh, should we do a roll call vote for this one, you think? Yeah, I think yes. that would be. Yes. Commissioner Sandy Brown? No. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Montesino? Yes. Commissioner uh, Alternate Schifrin? No. Oh. Commissioner Quinn? Yes. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Commissioner Pegler? Aye. Commissioner Rotkin? Aye. That passes. Thank you. All right. Um, congratulations. We will move on now to item nine, oral communications. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the commission on items that are not on uh, the agenda. And we'll start with those in chambers. Seeing none, we'll go to Zoom. Oh, I'm sorry. I spoke too soon. Hi, welcome. Thank you, Chair. This is Krista Corwin of your staff. Um, I'd like to comment on item 20. On behalf of four members of the admin and fiscal teams, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to give our input on the reorganization effort. CORE supports changes to the organizational structure as the agency's needs are changing, and we adapt our work to better serve the community. We especially appreciate the time that has been invested in listening to our members and the sincere efforts that have been made to address our concerns about workload and professional development. We look forward to welcoming the new recruits and moving forward in a positive direction in alignment with the RTC's goals. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. 
morning, commissioners, Amy Naranjo of your staff, and representing the collective of RTC employees core, uh, transportation planners and planning technicians. The planning team strongly supports the proposed planning positions to address our current and future needs. Specifically, we support retaining two planning technicians for vital project support to planners and reclassifying two planner positions to supervising planners for better workload management, career progression, and to assist in the mentorship and growth of junior staff. We also support including supervising senior planners in key agency leadership meetings and policy discussions to ensure balanced departmental representation. These changes will not only help manage workloads and prevent burnout, but also foster a supportive environment for staff growth. Additionally, we urge the RTC to periodically reassess and expand core planning team staffing levels to meet future needs, including addressed excuse me, including addressing deferred transportation infrastructure, climate adaptation, and the community's expanding needs for robust and equitable transportation options. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Jason Thompson of your staff, representing core staff currently assigned to branch rail line property management tasks. The planners and engineers who have been managing maintenance and real property tasks on the Santa Cruz branch rail line would like to thank you for supporting the creation of two new staff positions to take on our backlog of critical branch line property management, maintenance, and other real property tasks. The RTC will see great benefit from recruiting expertise specific to this area, and current staff managing real property tasks will see significant positive changes in their workload and their ability to focus on actual area of expertise. Thank you. Okay, seeing no further comments in the room, we'll go to Zoom. Ryan Samora. Good morning, commissioners. This is Brian Samora of your staff. Uh, on behalf of four members of the engineering team, uh, we appreciate the input for was able to provide on this step of the agency reorganizational effort, and we thank the commission for investing in hearing the concerns of that. We reiterate that the agency will see great benefit from recruiting the real property specialist and the real property technician uh, to address the task of the branch rail line and allow the engineering team and the planning team to focus on delivering transportation projects and investment for the community. Engineering staff look forward to continuing the great work this agency does and bringing board new agency staff. Thank you. Hi, this is uh, Brian Peoples with Trail Now. I believe that you, I didn't hear my cue, but I saw it come up. Um, two weeks ago at the Inter Technical Agency Committee meeting by the RTC, Ecology Action gave a presentation on their taxpayer funded trip with uh, about a dozen other local staff from the county and the city to go and visit Netherlands when they to look at their bike infrastructure. The four takeaways from that trip were that they build trails at a fraction of the cost of Santa Cruz. They do it faster in a timely manner and they don't clear cut trees and they don't prioritize, they prioritize bicycles and pedestrians over fossil fuel trains and cars. So in here, Santa Cruz, we build a trail, a 10 foot wide trail for $25 million a mile. That's truly unacceptable. We've only built one mile of the coastal trail in a decade. We're clear cutting hundreds of heritage trees and we're prioritizing a fossil fuel train over a trail. That doesn't seem right. So we actually are asking Ecology Action to step up and support the conversion of the Capitola trestle into a trail now, as recommended by Guy Preston years ago. That trestle cannot be used for a train today, and it cannot be used for a train in the future. 
So let's use that valuable asset today as recommended by staff as a trail. Thank you for your time. Good morning, this is Barry Scott, and I uh, assume this is open, uh, we're at public comment session, and I wanted to speak to something uh, relating to segment 11 of the trail um, along Park Avenue. The um, I took a walk down, more than one walk down Park Avenue, and I noticed that the, the uh, plan calls for the trail to be located between the tracks and the, the cliffs above which are Escalona Drive. Uh, I know that neighbors, uh, residents along there are concerned about uh, the need uh, to use some of their backyards. But my main concern is that Escalona, the bluff is so much higher than the tracks and the trail needs to be dug into the, the cliff side. And then there would be fencing between the trail and Park Avenue. And it seems to me that there's a wonderful opportunity here if the trail is kept on the Park Avenue side of the tracks away from the bluffs um, eliminating the need to take backyard property to, to build the trail. And uh, so we're talking about an eight or 12 foot wide dedicated trail with a two foot buffer and then Park Avenue with no fence except between the, the trail and the tracks. And then people can, uh, can get on the trail and off the trail to neighborhoods, to the side streets. And uh, that I believe it would be significantly less expensive than the major engineering and construction work that would be needed to stick the trail on the Escalona side of the track. So I hope everybody will give a look to that and maybe it could be a value engineering uh, adjustment to segment 11 there. Thanks very much. Doesn't look like we have any further comments. That is correct. Okay. Okay, um, so we are going to go now to our uh, consent agenda. Do we have any public comments on our consent agenda? Saying none in the room. Any online? Nope. Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. yes. Yes. Sorry, I can't see the. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Helmer. Mr. Helmer, do you have a public comment on our consent agenda today? You have been unmuted. Okay. All right, well, with that, um, we'll allow you to make uh, a comment at a future item if there's technical difficulties. In the meantime, we'll return uh, to the commission uh, for action on our consent agenda. I'll move the consent agenda. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Did you catch the first and the second on that one? Thank you. I have a comment. Oh, yes, please. I had a question on number 20. Okay. Number 20 is a recommendation to add staff, which I think is de desperately needed on um, to help with all the additional projects that are moving forward. Um, there was a little bit of sticker shock with the 900,000, and I know it's a, there's value there, but I'm just curious as to how that all spells out because it just seemed high for the three positions. Uh, yes, that, that 900,000, the three positions were approved in the uh, budget that the commission approved, I believe it was in April. Uh, that's based on the, the salaries and all the benefits for, for those, th those three positions uh, at classifications that were assumed at the time, along with a uh, differential for uh, converting two of our transportation planner positions to supervising transportation planners. Uh, it's an estimate. If we need to adjust it, we'll come back at the next commission meeting with an adjusted number. But um, yeah, I'm work. not quarreling with the, the number, really. I know sometimes just getting the type of help that's required in, in a uh, organization like this, uh, it's necessary. Uh, but at the same time, I, I, I want to uh, make sure that the value that is added 
is going to be sufficient to really help move this organization along. Yeah, and that that's an important point, and I, and I think uh, that touches a little bit on on one of the uh, comments we had earlier about the importance of doing a, a a real assessment every year of our what are our staffing levels, where are we going, what are the grants we're working on, what are the projects we're working on, do we have the right mix for us the next few years, and I think that's an important part of of, of what the commission has to do every year. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any further questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. We will move on now to our regular agenda with item 24, commissioner reports. Yes, please, Commissioner Rodkin. Um, I am your uh, an alternate representative from this agency to the Coastal Rail Coordinating Committee, which is a group of um, rail properties throughout uh, California along the coast. And I, I, a lot of times in our community, people are not, I'm, I don't think it's majority view, but there are strong views that rail is kind of in the past and not really happening and not supported. And I just want to say, I went to, uh, attended the last meeting online um, and there, there really is a vigorous act, uh, set of activities going on in support of rail in California, not just from the state, but at the federal level as well. And uh, having sat through a two hour meeting, um, got a really good sense of like how much rail really is in the future of California. And it, it, it doesn't give us any direct idea of how much funding we will or won't get for a rail project or whether our project is feasible or not or whatever. But but the, it, it, I think it's a uh, misunderstanding people who think that rail is dead or gone or past. Uh, it really is the future of California in many ways. And the, sitting through that meeting gave me a real sense of that. And I just wanted to share that with the rest of the board. Thank you. Thank you. Comments, reports, nothing? Okay, uh, I'll just say briefly, um, I'm excited to share that work has begun on the walkway in Capitola's upper parking lot up to the Park Avenue and Monterey Avenue intersection. Uh, this project was funded in part through a grant through the RTC and it's creating a safer path out of our parking lot for visitors and residents alike. Um, looking forward to the completion of this project. Prior to this, uh, people were just walking in the middle of the streets to come up from the uh, upper parking lot in Capitola. So wanted to share that exciting uh, progress. Okay, with that, we will move on to our director's report. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, I'd like to begin by congratulating Sarah on her appointment to be our new executive director. I was acquainted with Sarah before I came to RTC and ha have had the opportunity to get to know her much better in my time here. I know that with her, her extensive project delivery experience, her intelligence, her tenacity, and her passion for our community, that Sarah will do a great job for RTC and the people of Santa Cruz County. Um, next, I'd like to provide a, a updates on uh, on a few items. Uh, first, I, I attended that the same meeting uh, Commissioner Rockin did in person, and there there is a lot of excitement about trying to bring more rail to uh, to the Central Coast. Uh, one of the things we we're working on internally is bringing a representative from Caltrans in to talk a little bit about the federal corridor ID program. Uh, so I hope that will be happening uh, shortly. One of the things I would also note there, I had the, I was there in person, had the opportunity to get up uh, early and go for a run along their trail, which is uh, next to their rail line. Uh, it's was at, at some point narrows down to an eight foot wide trail within a 14 foot right away. And it was being well used and did not feel at all unsafe or you know uncomfortable as a user. Um, next, I'd like to up to date, update you on a few things we're working on. Um, first, as a potential uh, cost reduction strategy for segments nine through 11 of the Coast Rail Trail, staff and Roaring Camp Railroads have been discussing the possibility of Roaring Camp completing the track relocation required for the projects and the associated grading at Roaring Camp's expense. Uh, Roaring Camp recently provided us with a draft memorandum of understanding de describing their intent to relocate within uh, the portions of segments 9 and 10. We're going to continue to work with Roaring Camp on the, the terms of a potential agreement, and we'll provide you with the update at our October meeting. Uh, next, uh, about the Rural Highway Safety Plan. Um, 
That is a plan that seeks to uh, enhance safety for all modes of transportation on Santa Cruz County's six conventional highways through data-driven analysis of crash patterns. The plan will build upon and update the SLB Complete Streets plan while also expanding the scope to provide a path to Vision Zero, identifying safety enhancements for all local rural highways to work towards the goal of zero tra traffic deaths and serious injuries by 2050. The project is currently in the process of gathering data and we're seeking the community's assistance. Uh, we know many crashes go unreported and near misses and locations that are perceived as uncomfortable to travel are important for us to learn about in this process. A map-based survey will be available on our website uh, starting on Wednesday, September 18th. Community members can provide input on where and why they feel safety enhancements are needed. They can also sign up for a Vision Zero e-newsletter for project updates. Uh, and uh, next, the Transportation Development Act performance audits. Uh, the act requires that all regional transportation planning agencies and transit operators that receive these TDA funds go through a performance audit every three years. As directed in statute, the audit shall evaluate the efficiency, effectiveness, and economy of the operation of the entity being audited. As a part of the audit, the auditors, Michael Baker International, will reach out to commissioners to obtain your input on the performance of RTC over the three-year period being covered by the audit. Um, lastly, I'd like to uh, thank commissioners for the opportunity they've given me. Uh, to uh, serve as your interim executive director. It's uh, really been a, a pleasure working with you all. Um, I'd like to thank the staff for their support. Uh, for, you know, for a lot of you people, I was just somebody new dropping in that you had to deal with. Um, and then I'd like to thank the members of the, the community. Um, as you all know, we have a very active and engaged community. And I've been really impressed really with the the high quality of comments and, and the thoughtfulness that they provide. So I'd like to thank everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the commission? Yes, please. I would just like to say um, we're grateful for your humor, your knowledge, and you serve this uh, commission and this community very well. And even though I'm happy with our, our new executive director, it's been a pleasure working with you as well. Yes. I agree with uh, most of the comments of the previous management of Johnson. And uh, I really want to thank you for all the work that you did and the enthusiasm you brought to the commission and your dedication to trying to move the commission, move the commission projects forward. Uh, I think you've done an excellent job and I hope, you know, you will remain uh, available to our new executive director and um i know you're working on some labor negotiations but beyond that i think your experience and um knowledge can be helpful to the commission over time so I, again i really want to appreciate all your all the work that you've done on this interim period yes yeah i too want to just give you my uh my thank yous for for stepping in uh, i feel that you know as a as an agency as an organization we've been uh we've struggled for a long time and your presence has really provided uh i think a, a steady hand for us during a, a challenging time uh we will definitely miss you and um as commissioner Schifrin said hope that you will continue to that your your um enjoyment of our very active community will cause you to <laughs> want to <laughs> remain uh connected to our work thank you so much yes commissioner Rock. i just wanted to add more specifically I, I don't know if people appreciate how difficult it is to be an interim director of anything um you step in with not a lot of authority and you have to try and manage a, a staff and make that happen and i think you've done a magnificent job of that um and as I said, it's like uh, difficult to be a director of anything, but an interim director really puts a person in a difficult position. And I think you've really done an outstanding job for us and the community really appreciates the work that you've done. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Montesino. Yeah, I just want to thank you. Uh, good job. We hired you for a specific time frame. Did, did the job. Thank you. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Um, I want to um, echo Commissioner Sandy Brown's comments about the stability that you've brought uh, in your time here. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you. I'm grateful for um, your accessibility, both in setting up the weekly meetings that we have to discuss uh, the agenda and what's happening here at the RTC, and also for taking my many calls in between those weekly meetings with all of the questions and uh, concerns I have outside of them. Um, we, are, we are grateful and fortunate to have had you in this interim period, and thank you again for, for your time. Okay, we will go to public comment on this item, and we'll start with those in the room. Good morning, commissioners. Rachel Marconi of your staff. I want to echo um, some of the comments that many of the commissioners have stated. Mitch and I have known each other for a very long time um, during my multiple trips to Sacramento. And um, I'm so excited that he finally came to Santa Cruz. I tried to recruit him many times for our executive director positions. And um, it was just a real pleasure to have you here. And um, I think we have a similar sense of humor and frankness with each other that we can cut through some of the other stuff and not always be nice to each other, but really like each other. So um, thank you for coming to Santa Cruz and, and leading our organization for a while, quite a while. And I know you'll be back and we'll see you around. Yeah. I also want to thank Mitch. Um, I appreciate your, your work style. It's been um, a pleasure to work with you. I'm going to totally miss your weekend emails. <laughs> Hi. Hi, my name is Tracy New and I'm your staff. Um, I never got weekend emails, so I'm a little bit jealous, <laughs> but I do want to say that I really appreciate the time that you spent with us and what you brought to the agency. We really needed a sense of calm. You came in, you had a task reorg and meet and confer are not easy. You did it with humor and personability and we really appreciate that. So thank you commission for hiring somebody that had the leadership qualities and the leadership skills and leadership experience we needed at the time. Thank you. Good morning commission, Sarah Christensen of yourself, Director Weiss, Mitch. Um, it's been lovely having you here for about nine months. Um, I'm going to miss your sense of humor. Um, and we all who've worked with Mitch uh, closely all recognize he does have a sense of humor. Um, and we appreciate you getting us through the restructuring. Um, that was not an easy job. So next time we restructure, we're going to call you back and um, invite you back. Just kidding. Um, a few noteworthy things that Mitch was able to accomplish in his short time here. Uh, we have a new conference room, um, which is a lovely conference room. Um, and we also were able to uh, increase our fleet by buying a forerunner for our staff, which is going to be great for going out in the field and doing all of the various business that we need to do as staff. Um, you know, Mitch and I have been joking and he's been joking with staff about um, naming the conference room after him as a commemorative, you know, the Mitch Weiss commemorative conference room. And we thought that was a little much for the nine months that he's here. <laughs> <laughs> so we have um, hereby named the forerunner after you, Mitch. <laughs> so um, thank you very much for your diligence in that purchase. And uh, we'll be keeping you in our memory every time we go out in the field. So thank you. Thank you. Um, any comments on Zoom? Mr. Brian Peoples. Yeah, hi, this is Brian with Trail Now. So I uh, want to express our appreciation for Mitch coming in the town. I know you had to live away from your community and really appreciate you taking the time and, and doing the efforts that you did do. I do want to comment a little bit about your comments about the rail and and I just I'm, I'm assuming that they talked about the Del Mar down in Southern California being relocated, developing plans to relocate from the beach, just like our rail for an existing rail. So when we say there's going to be rail here, we still are far from understanding the limitations when we think about the Coastal Commission. And just look at what happened on Monterey recently on their busway. They got declined by the Coastal Commission. And then on the comment about Roaring Camp, I'm hoping you're not selling a 
Roaring Camp, selling us out to Roaring Camp, realizing that we're putting Roaring Camp over the community. Is the idea that Roaring Camp is going to be running tourist trains when they redo these tracks? So I hope that there's a lot of public discussion about what you're selling out to Roaring Camp. It's surprising with all the lawsuits you're doing to the private property owners along the railroad, but you're not doing anything. You're you're just giving away to Roaring Camp everything. Mr. Peoples, please ensure that careful. your comments are on the item. Well, it, it is the item because he spoke of, it's the director report and he spoke about his negotiations with Roaring Camp. So I want to make sure that that is public information and please don't sell us out. Thank you. Ms. Seagal. Good morning. This is Dana Siegel speaking on behalf of Santa Cruz County Friends of the Rail and Trail this morning. We wanted to echo um, many of the comments made by commissioners. It has been an absolute pleasure to work with you. Um, Mitch, and we hope uh, we'll see you come back often and uh, uh, continue to help us move our projects forward. Thank you for your help with our county. Thank you. Seeing no further comments online, uh, we will bring it back. Uh, and we are on item 26, our Caltrans report. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, Chair, this is Brandy Ryder. I'm the Deputy District Director for Transportation Planning for Caltrans. I have a couple of announcements, um, but before I do that, I just wanted to congratulate Sarah for her recent appointment to Executive Director. Caltrans has a very long history of partnering and collaborating with the RTC, so we very much look forward to that continuation of that partnership and working um, with her in that new executive role and capacity and working with your team as they grow. And um, so we're very much looking forward to that. Mitch, we also will miss you at Caltrans. It's been great to have you in this new capacity compared to um, the CTC. It was a different role for you. And so it's been a lot of fun to have you on the Central Coast Coalition and working with us um, primarily on projects in Santa Cruz County. So we will miss you in that role. Okay, so to my announcements, uh, we have a rolling closure coming up on Highway 1 on Sunday, September 8th. We had a press release come out for this. Um, it's for the bike portion of the Ironman uh, in Santa Cruz. So travelers on Highway 1 north of Santa Cruz will be subject to a rolling closure of the roadway on Sunday, September 8th as competitors in the bike portion of the Ironman participate in this 56 mile portion of the race. Northbound Highway 1 will be closed between Western Drive in Santa Cruz and Pigeon Point Road in San Mateo County from 7 a.m. to 9.30 as the riders complete the first leg of the ride. And then on the southbound, Highway 1 will be closed Sunday, September 8th between Pigeon Point Road and Western Drive from 8.15 to 11.45 as riders complete the return leg. Uh, there is a press release out on that. We can definitely share it with anybody if they have not received it. Uh, our second announcement is the single lane overnight closures on Highway 1 between 41st and SoCal. You've probably also seen a press release on that. It has had single lane overnight closures um, this last September 3rd and the 4th, and the final night is tonight, September 5th. Uh, travelers will encounter the enclosure of a single lane of both north and southbound Highway 1 between 41st and SoCal, and they'll be effective between 9 p.m. and 5.30 a.m. And then finally, our 2025-2026 Sustainable Transportation Planning Grant Program, the grant guidance is out. I wanted to let you folks know that until September 30th, we're taking public comment on the grant guidance. Um, one notable change is that under the, our strategic partnerships, we are now opening that up to a transit category where transit agencies previously had to work with an RTPA or an MPO in order to apply. They can now apply as their own um, applicant, as a primary applicant. So that's exciting. Um, we will be hosting uh, virtual uh, application workshops October 2nd and 3rd. And so if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me or uh, a member of my staff and we can get you more information. And that concludes my report. Uh, I can answer any questions if folks have them. Thank you. Any questions? Questions from the commission? 
All right, seeing none, we'll take public comment. Is there any public comment in the room? Seeing none, we'll go online. Is there any public comment online for this item? Mr. Brian Peoples. Hi, it's Brian Peoples with Trail Now. I just want to thank Caltrans for the work they're doing on widening Highway 1. I know you guys catch a lot of flack, but I think you're all doing a phenomenal job. Um, so I appreciate that. I personally live in Aptos. I don't actually have to use the, the highway a lot, but I, I think you're doing a great job. And I just wanted to commend you for that. Um, the other thing I wanted to comment on about the highway widening in phase three. And the, um, so over the weekend, I was at a, in Santa Cruz at a home on the west side. And actually, it was uh, an open forum with the, the C, meet and greet with the new Metro CEO. And it was Campaign for Sensible Transportation. They invited me. I get along with them. What I found frustrating, though, is that organization is trying to stop the widening of the highway phase three through Aptos. And it's really frustrating when I'm sitting in his home and, and he lives on the west side and he's not impacted where other our community in Aptos is impacted if we can't get through when we have traffic like we do. So that's frustrating when I hear Santa Cruz people telling me that, no, we're not going to widen high, the highway by Aptos. And they're sitting in their house over on the west side and they're not impacted. So that's very frustrating. But again, I just want to thank Caltrans. You guys are doing a phenomenal job in any way that Trial Now can support getting the word out. We try to do that. Thank you for your time. Santa Clara being used prior to Highway 1 being completed. Um, maybe Caltrans or I don't know, maybe the staff can say something. If the earlier that can be done, the safer it's going to be for everyone. Uh, yeah. I wonder if that's a possibility. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Uh, Caltrans is going to provide more information on that in the next item, but we are working on it and we are um, hopeful yes. that it will be open early. Thank you. Chair Brown, we do have another speaker online. Oh, okay. Mr. He Oops, sorry about that. I got you guys are on mute. Yes. Mr. Mr. Helder. <clears throat> yes, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I'd first like to congratulate Sarah Christensen and to Mr. Weiss for his interim leadership. I would like to speak to your May 4th uh, unanimous action to request Caltrans to lower the speed limit on Highway 9 in Ben Loman, Brookdale, and a portion of Felton, uh, based upon the authority vested in the director with the passage and signing into law of Assembly Bill 43. Your request was forwarded to Caltrans in June. It's now almost two and a half months since that request has been made. And apparently, um, Caltrans is not really choosing to use its authority to take a proactive approach to reduce crashes and um, lower speeding on Highway 9. It, um, it's why the law was passed, to help Caltrans have the same authority that local agencies have on state highways and rural communities that serve as main streets quite frustrating. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, um, our new leadership can encourage Caltrans to, to move forward on that. Lastly, 12 years ago, we took a bus tour when Supervisor McPherson was elected. There was a tree identified in Ben Lomond as a risk to pedestrians in traffic. If you look at the redwood tree, it, the scars show it. Uh, 12 years has gone by. It's identified in the complete streets plan as a tree that should be removed or at a minimum the striping restriped to the east with a new resurfacing project being planned this month. It's a perfect opportunity to move the stripes about three feet to provide more room for pedestrians to walk by this very, very narrow, unsafe tree. Thank you. 
All right, we will bring uh, this item back. Any further questions or comments? Yes, go ahead, Commissioner Rodkin. I just wanted to comment on Jim Helmer's comment about the uh, moving ahead with the traffic speed issue. Um, as I pointed out in our last meeting or the one before, the alternative is this absurd situation where the only way you can bring the speed down is by first posting a higher speed and then have running radar to test you know, how many people are going what speeds and come up with a certain percentage of that speed and move it down. And you know, Caltrans has the authority to move straight ahead to re reduce the, uh, the speed limit on the on that street. And I do hope that they will uh, pay attention to Jim Homer's comment about that. It's a very dangerous uh, strip of the highway. And they, they, it, it's not that difficult by its administrative action. They can save lives on, on Highway 9. That's it. Thank you. All right. With that, we will move on now to item 27. Highway 1, 41st Avenue to Soquel Drive Auxiliary Lanes and Bus on Shoulder Project. Caltrans request for additional funding to cover cost overruns on the construction capital component of the project. Hello. Hi. Thank you, Chair Brown. Chair Christensen of your staff. Um, I've been working over the last several weeks with Caltrans on a request that was made back in August uh, for additional funding to cover uh, current and anticipated cost overruns on the construction capital component of the Highway 1, 41st Avenue to Soquel Drive and Chanticleer Bicycle and Pedestrian Overcrossing Project. We've been working diligently and since that time, uh, the $5 million request has been reduced. Um, now we're around 4 million and that number continues to dwindle down as we work through details. Um, today, uh, the recommendation is for um, the commission to authorize amendments to the cooperative agreement with Caltrans uh, for a total value not to exceed 2.5 million. Uh, for the construction capital component of the project and to program an additional uh, $2.5 million of Measure D Highway Corridor funds in fiscal year, uh, in the current fiscal year, and amend the budget accordingly. And the reason um, we are proposing to uh, program only $2.5 million is because that's really all we have uh, in terms of pay as you go capacity in the current fiscal year. So uh, we are proposing, staff is proposing um, to take a phased approach. Uh, we want to keep the project moving. It's important to do that because if we were to stop the project, that would cost even more money to stop and then start again. So we're working with our partners at Caltrans. They have a, a PowerPoint presentation for you today and uh, we'll all be available to answer questions if you have any following the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Can you hear me okay? Um, with, with me, my name is Madeline Jacobson. I'm a Caltrans project manager on this project. And with me is our deputy district director for construction and project delivery, uh, Tim Campbell. And so together I'll provide the presentation and Tim will support any answering questions. So um, yes, this morning I will cover a couple different things related to construction of this project including construction progress in general, providing you some pictures, which are always great to see, uh, covering some of the construction challenges sort of resulting in this cost need, discussing a few of the project risks going forward, some project successes to be proud of, the funding needs that, that Sarah described and are summarized in the staff recommendation. To date, construction of the progress is approximately uh, construction of the project is approximately 60% complete. The team has completed construction of the northbound and southbound outside widening. This includes the drainage, three of the retaining walls, earthwork and grading work, as well as a concrete barrier. Just a couple weeks ago, we completed the stage one traffic shift on the project. And the team has completed construction of the overhead sign structure foundations. The new Chanticleer pedestrian overcrossing is about 90% complete. And as alluded to, we're working with the RTC to try to advance opening of that overcrossing. Um, irrigation for new planting is 75% complete. This picture here shows you a visual reference for construction progress. And so you can see in the December picture, the bridge columns there. And then just recently we flew 
drones to get some more recent progress pictures there now visible on the screen. And yeah. So this project was unique in its development and it's encountered a number of construction challenges that have come to fruition in the field through change orders. As part of my update this morning, I'm going to summarize a couple of the categories of these challenges and change orders that are resulting in the financial need that's before the commission. So, but first, um, I come from a background in planning and this process was a learning experience for me. And so I'm going to provide a briefing on the change order process. So change orders are a normal process that happen in most every construction project. And it's a, a way to document the change that's happening in the field as well as the cost associated with it related to the unexpected issues. So typically speaking, the issue as identified in the field, our field or design engineers will evaluate that problem. Then construction will initiate the change order documentation. We'll work with the contractor to define the issue and estimate project the associated cost. And then ultimately payment will be made. And that final cost may vary from the estimated cost. In our case, our change order process is dynamic. We have Caltrans as the implementing agency for construction, the RTC as the project sponsor, Mark Thomas as the engineer of record, as well as Granite Construction. On the topic of safety, this project has encountered the need to replace numerous crash cushions like those pictured there on the screen at a rate that was higher than we originally were budgeted for. There was also a change order that our team coordinated with the county on to install a temporary pedestrian access route that was not originally part of our budget. Our project has encountered a number of design changes and unforeseen conditions that are contributing to the project cost. And this list here summarizes a handful of them. So there were some design modifications triggered by differences between the plans and the existing conditions regarding issues like drainage and elevation. There were some modifications to roadway signage, some design conflicts with existing trees and electrolier along Soquel Drive. That's like a light. Inaccuracies with some of the earthwork and staking notes, some utility conflicts, and then some challenges with unsuitable existing materials or soil conditions. Similarly, we've had some changes related to the pedestrian overcrossing. And this includes a pending modification, although just this morning I heard may be resolved related to a bridge column. Um, an item brought forward as part of the amendment back in June related to the Soquel Creek Water District and the pedestrian railing change. And then one change related to Buy America requirements and the light poles on the structure. Going forward, we're uh, just now entering or started stage two construction. And so there may be some additional unforeseen changes, change orders that come to fruition through stage two. And so that is one of the, the first project risks here listed. We're aware of a potential change order related to unsuitable materials or the soil conditions in the center median. And that's a potential risk uh, that we're monitoring together. Um, we also, a handful of these changes, like I mentioned, resolve our design team, and some of them have not been completed yet, the design work. And so until those are resolved, there's still pending sort of issues or risks for the project team. And then overall, the project's financial health and the contingency needs, and that's, and that's why we're here today. So while this, this project has faced a number of challenges, um, we have a handful of successes that our team and the RTC and Caltrans are, should be really proud of. Uh, recently, we secured a Success in Motion Gold Award for successful collaboration and partnering, which is an awesome representation of our teamwork. We also have maintained a safe and productive job site, which is vital to the traveling public and our crews. Financially, our team has avoided nearly $4 million in potential conflicts or claims. And additionally, um, as we've navigated a number of design changes, the contractor on the job has remained flexible with us and they've performed some other work in areas where we were dissolving design changes or things like that. Um, and lastly, as we, we mentioned, we're working with the RTC to advance opening of the pedestrian overcrossing with the goal of late spring 2025.
This slide summarizes the construction capital needs that are before you today and in the staff report. Um, adding together the estimated change order costs, the item overruns, which I have that definition there for you, um, contingency for remaining work, and then subtracting our original contingency amount and the balance from some project cost savings. The need before you today for our remaining work, I should say, correction, um, is about $3.9 million. But as Sarah mentioned, um, the specific staff recommendation, go to the next slide, is for $2.5 million. So the staff recommendations that we've been collaborating on with the RTC is to take a phased approach to addressing the cost overruns, executing the co-op agreement uh, with an amount not to exceed $2.5 million, the programming action more specifically tied to the RTC, and then additionally, we are anticipating an item in November for that remaining need, the difference between the 3.9 and 2.5 as part of the Measure D five-year plan update. And that concludes the presentation and we're here to answer your questions. Thank you. We'll start with questions. Commissioner Schifrin. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that report. It's very helpful. It wasn't clear to me what role the commission staff has in reviewing or approving these change order requests. Sounds like the contractor makes the request to Caltrans. At some point, they're approved, and then they go out and do the work. Is that correct? Uh, yes. And then also, we're, we work very closely with the, the design team at Mark Thomas and with staff to um, as, we, as the issues come up. Does the... Uh, commission staff have any uh, ability to have a different, you know, to reach a different conclusion from Caltrans. In other words, there's a change order that Caltrans is ready to approve, but the commission mm -hmm. staff thinks that it's too much or it's inappropriate. Uh, what really is a legal role in terms of the commission staff being able to um, control the costs so uh commission staff will be able to concur on major change orders um and then also we a lot of the changes that require um changes to the plan set uh require the project the, the project engineer right so the design the designer of record um and so that is also controlled through um through staff does the commission staff have the right to not con concur with a change order and what happens if that depend on what the issue is right so we have, we have a multitude of of issues out there and so for example some of these might be to pay for for uh, utilities that were encountered right so we need to make, move the drainage systems so there's really not in many cases this is typical for construction um there are matching a plan set a two-dimensional plan set and all the engineering that goes behind it um, with the actual field conditions can be challenging. And so when you come into those unforeseen circumstances where you have to make changes to the drainage systems, maybe the flow lines need to change and maybe we need to add a temporary drainage system based on uh, the way the staging of the work went. So, so many times there's not really any other choices, but once again, we work collabor collaboratively with the team to identify that. So this is not in a case where a contractor just says, hey, I have an issue and and we write a change order right so it's analyzed by our field engineers with the design engineers at mark thomas and then with the oversight of staff the one uh one that jumps out at me in the presentation that um is probably a minor one is where the socal creek water district asks for new railings and we go out and spend money to do new railings um is there um it seems unusual if, one, why they care, and two, why they don't pay for it if that's what they want. I'll answer your, your comment by saying they are contributing to it. So the co-op amendment that happened in June included a financial contribution. It's coming through the RTC to Caltrans to, to pay for that railing change. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I feel better about that. The, my final question um, is uh, to the extent that the problem has resulted or the need for change uh, has resulted because of a mistake in the design that somehow the, the, the construction drawing should have identified a problem that then turned out to, to occur. Is there any ability to go back to the uh, 
uh, des design the engineers that designed it and have them have to pay for the change order rather than the commission having to pay for all these change orders. How does well, that work? Well, first, uh, I'll, for the bulk of it, I'll, I'll allow uh, Sarah to speak to that. But um, this, so in any project, no matter wh where we're at, right? In Caltrans, when we design a project, it is not designed 100% perfect, right? It's designed with the, you, you're on a timeline, you're trying to design the best project possible. And you, the goal is to have a 100% perfect set of plans. But the reality of construction is, is that when you get out there to the field, conditions can be different, right? We survey points that are, you know, 50 feet apart and you might have something in between, right? So the design elements is a lot of effort goes into it and a lot of energy, but it's a, it's a misnomer if we think that designs are that there's not errors in the plans. And so some of them are unforeseen. Some might be just minor deviations. That is, that is fairly normal in construction. And that's why we do have contingencies. This is a very Mistakes challenging times do get made. And yeah, just, these are, is there any, and um, these are challenging. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Is there any sorry. ability to, uh, to uh, have the, either the construction company or the designers be responsible for paying for the, those changes? Uh, frankly, I, my questions are, I always am a little uncomfortable where there's one per one agency that's determining what things should cost and another agency that's paying for it. Um, so, you know, I, it's sort of, it seems important to really understand that the agency that's paying for it, which in this case is us, um, really is paying the minimum that it has to pay. I understand that there are going to be changes for complex projects and um, that does happen all the time, but I think the process is a little bit... So so as Cal, as administering the construction contracts, Caltrans administered just some, like our oath, like we're spending our money. And so we we very much scrutinize all the estimates that come in from a contractor, for example. Um, some items are just the, the actual cost of the work. For the contract, for example, when the crash cushions get hit, the contractor gets paid what we call force account time and materials. And so it's just an actual cost at agreed, agreed upon contract rental rates for the equipment and the labor. And so... Um, that's the way that can occur. So, but we do scrutinize the cost very, um, the contractors don't just submit a cost. And, and to your question about if a contractor makes a mistake, no, we don't pay for contractors errors. And so contractors, they have had um, errors where they may put a pile in the wrong place. We might come to help with the resolution in terms of can that pile stay where it is. Or, um, and so we can work on that, but it'll be a no cost change or the contractor doesn't get compensated for any errors that they make. They're, um, that's their responsibility. Please. Sure. And I would just like to add um, regarding the uh, differences in design and field conditions, we have uh, been working with Caltrans through this process have been uh, become aware of some changes that were potentially design related and we're still working through those. This is really an iterative process that we're going through right now. Um, and, you know, we've been working collaboratively before construction, Caltrans providing oversight reviews of the plans and getting the field staff to review those plans. And um, this is a unique project because the, the uh, conditions have changed. In fact, between the design being finished and construction actually starting, it was about a two or three year gap. And during that two or three year gap, there was actually a Caltrans led state Highway um, Operation Protection Program or SHOP project that came in and made a bunch of changes to the highway. And so we had to kind of try to update the plans as best as we could without having to redesign the whole thing. Um, staff was actually trying to get that project combined with this auxiliary lane and bus on shoulder project. And we were not successful in doing that because of um, limitations to funding deadlines for the shop program. And so um, I would just say that that is one unique factor and uh, we're still looking at these design changes um, that, you know, there may be a remedy, but um, obviously it's going to take a lot more time and review by staff to, um, to see if that's going to come to fruition, but it is possible. Is this the, what you're talking about? What was in this, was it in this item where it was talked about value engineering as part of the construction process, which seemed unusual to me. Usually you do value engineering before, um, but what you're describing is that what's being, would that be under the heading of value engineering to reduce the additional costs for the construction project? It's 
Sure. Yeah, I, I'll just add um, to your earlier point and question about staff's ability to control or contribute or collaborate and decision making um, up to this point. Um, you know, the commission has uh, entered into a cooperative agreement that identifies Caltrans as the implementing agency for construction. So we're really putting our trust in Caltrans to lead this project. Our role is more of the sponsor and we manage the designer, designer of record. And, you know, when there's large change orders or big uh, risky things that come up, we get pulled in immediately um, and we contribute, but um, we don't have a whole lot of control. Um, it's really Caltrans as the implementing agency is really in control of the construction. It's their inspectors out there. They're managing the construction contract. And so um, it's collaborative, but we don't have a whole lot of uh, direct control over what um, happens out there. We can kindly ask, which I'm not shy about doing, uh, to potentially reduce um, things like sign structures that, uh, you know, we have a changeable message sign structure. The total cost of that is about a half a million dollars. And we've successfully... Um, been able to, as a value engineering measure during construction, defer the installation of that to a future shop project by Caltrans. And so, you know, although there's going to be a little bit of a gap between ha having, you know, not having a changeable message sign, um, it's going to benefit our overall uh, budget and help us balance things out. So we've been continuously uh, requesting value engineering changes uh, from the get go. Is it? Uh, fair to say that by bringing these forward, uh, RTC staff is in agreement with the uh, um, decisions that Caltrans made. Because you, you know, talked about there's a difference between co uh, collaboration and control. Right. But, uh, ultimately, you're recommending, as I understand, or staff is recommending that the commission approve these change orders. So I'm assuming that that means that you agree with the decisions that Caltrans has made or staff agrees. Sure. The cooperative agreement between Caltrans and the RTC requires that uh, RTC staff concur with change orders with a value greater than $50,000. I have conferred, uh, let's see, maybe three or four I've that have come across my desk and I've yet to not concur. So, um, you know, we're pretty plugged in. And by the time the change order actually gets processed, sometimes it's six or 12 months after the issue is identified. So we're we're involved. Um, I will say that this is somewhat of a unique project in my experience for construction to have the designer so involved. Um, and, you know, it's RTC's having to pay for all of it. We pay, you know, we have Caltrans as implementing agency. We also have our designer of record who we have to, you know, um, amend their contract if if their services are continuing to be needed during construction. So it's it has been unique in that way of involving the designers. Um, in my experience, there's a lot of field changes that happen that don't require the engineer of record to, you know, redesign or or sign off on everything. So that's new to me and um, it's resulting in a higher cost to the project. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions on this end? Questions? Yes, go ahead, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this is not your first project, obviously, and I'm just wondering, you know, at the beginning, don't you anticipate change orders and budget th those in as far as uh, as a like a budget cushion to to kind of absorb these uh, changes? Contingency. Yes, there's a contingency built into the project, but apparently not enough. We're exceeding. We're going to exceed that limit. Yes. So is it okay? Um, so you know, I think there was also a something like a three million dollar in June, and also now we're talking about five million dollars a few months later. You know, a million here, a million there. Pretty soon, you're talking about real money, right? And um, I remember back then, even though we approved it without much discussion or or whatever, uh, it flowed pretty smoothly. There was a, uh, I think I went to staff and asked, you know, kind of what's causing this, and they talked about consultants, you know, consultants working on your behalf instead of having your staff be the ones who are making decisions and working on this project. 
And I think I saw something like 150 or $200 an hour for a consultant. And that kind of shocked me. Would you like to address that and see if, because, because it seems like, you know, anytime uh, and in city of Scotts Valley here at, at this commission, anytime you use consultants as a staff, it really adds to a project. Am I wrong? That's, that's accurate. And so to address the question, it's like, yeah, it is, it is a challenge. And so we are trying to minimize the amount of consultants that we use, but Caltrans does utilize consultants on all of our projects. And that is how we um, staff many of our jobs. Um, but we try to reduce based on the concerns here where, and we are trying to reduce the number of consultants we have, but um, hiring has been challenges here, uh, have been challenging here to uh, find local engineers, right? So we've been running advertisements for local engineers and, and people with experience. And so um, we do just standard in every, most projects we do have consultants. So a large percentage. Right. But I, but I, it sounds, I, I think I heard you say we're trying to reduce the use of consultants. Have you been successful in that? Yes, we've moved. I've been moving staff around to accommodate. Okay. And then to proactively, um, um, so, we, so three months from now, we don't want to have another session like this. And I'm just hoping that you're proactively because, you know, we have a phase three part of this project. Um, and again, I'm not an engineer and I just sit up here, but um, to, to me, finishing this and finish it on time and, and, and on budget is critical for our taxpayers. So I'm, I'm hopeful um, as, as far as the, the third phase of this project, are you anticipating more of this or what? So I can tell you that between the projects like phase one and phase two, we're learning some lessons, right? And so things that we've, we're learning and encountering on this um, phase one, we can apply to phase two or things that we've done in phase two for like the unsuitable material, which is the soil, subsoil conditions, right? We tear out the road bed or we tear out the median and find out that the conditions aren't suitable and, and it starts moving and we need to stabilize that. And so um, we've spent some time and, and energy on phase two or a large section there to find a more cost effective way to do that. And we'll apply that to phase one as we tear up the median now. So. For the phase three project, I believe we just received the 95% cost estimate for that project. And we're in the process of collaborating on a grant application now. And so we will, as a team, be carrying the lessons learned from these two jobs in construction into what the, the ask is in the grant application, the contingency that we request, the support estimate that we have going into the grant application process as opposed to seeing it sort of evolve the way these two have or this one project has. Well, I wish you luck. You know, I know uh, it's a big project. Um, and I hope you understand that we're, we have to be a little bit of watchdogs on behalf of the people's money and uh, watch it carefully. So um, let's collaborate on that. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, first of all, this commend you on the great work on the, the whale bridge. I mean, of course, in our contractor granite construction, um, it's a beautiful addition to the community. Um, we can't wait to actually write it. I'm sure it will become uh, one of the great attractions of Santa Cruz County. What are you doing this weekend? I'm riding the whale bridge. Um, so as far as, uh, as, you know, as far as construction goes, totally understand that there's unforeseen challenges that come up. Um, I think the, the concern that you're, you've heard from my colleagues and that I'll echo is that, you know, what's the actual cost of effectively addressing those, um, those changes? And um, I mean, I am, I am concerned that, you know, we're a lot of contractors are being used on the project and even subcontractors and just like the level of oversight um, you know, I understand that you guys have a ton of projects you're trying to manage, but it's our money. And like, we don't have a whole lot in this county, unfortunately. Um, and we really want to be able to finish this project and get all the way through phase three. I mean, I, my understanding is we'll probably see, uh, the, you know, maybe as much as 80% of the benefit of the entire project when phase three is completed. And so we need to make sure that we, we have visibility to doing that. And that means controlling costs. I mean, my colleague said, I hope you're not coming back in a few more months. I mean, actually the memo says that you are, right? Um, so what can we do? 
what can we do to make sure that uh, we really keep these change orders like as small as possible? I mean, to this, I mean, you've, you've kind of answered a little bit. I'm also looking to, um, you know, our interim executive director, <laughs> Mitch over here, uh, who has a, a lot more experience working on these projects. I mean, is it a, sh a cost sharing agreement for cost overruns in phase three? Is it allowing our staff, RTC staff to have, um, you know, sort of, or immediate uh, review opportunity. I mean, I don't I, uh, when these change orders come in so that we can actually do something about it rather than getting them five months later and saying, okay, well, you better approve this, otherwise the project's gonna be ground to a, it's gonna ground to a halt. Um, you know, because maybe it's just a matter of okay, we get the bill from the consultant, it's two million dollars and or two hundred thousand. We look at it and we're like, well, actually, you know, you misclassified uh, this or that person, and when you add this all together, it's actually a hundred thousand dollars. I mean, you do that enough times, and uh, you know, as Commissioner Johnson said, we're talking about real money. So, yeah, question for you, Interim Director Weiss. Uh, well, I, I would say some of that, uh, your incoming executive director has much more experience than I. I guess the, the questions I would have were really about, um, so a couple of things you mentioned, um, I mean, just getting into the specifics, less of the, the you know, fewer of the generalities. Um, when Caltrans is, is replacing crash cushions or, or doing signage normally on the state highway system, is that funded through your maintenance program or your shop program? So replacing the crash cushions and be clear. So as we we have the temporary barriers out there, the K rail, right, yeah. with the crash cushions in okay, front of them so to protect part of those in treatments. Okay. And so when a when a vehicle hits that, when the public traffic hits the crash cushion, contractor needs to replace it. So that's okay. that's paid for as part in, in the contract, right? The the department pays for that. So we we pay for that. That's part of the contract. And then in regards to the question about some of the rates and everything, and concerned about costs for in regards to the contractor now. Um, you know, they are, we do have uh, agreed upon rates. So we can either agree to the work up front at a price that we both think it's going to take before the work happens, or if the work happens, we, or we don't agree, we do it at what's called force account rates, which are prescribed in the contract. So they're accurate to what the contract is. So we're not like, there's not profit built, extra profit built in or anything like that. They're accurate cost of how many hours and the actual cost of materials and the actual rental hours of the equipment. Um, and so signage, is this a re replacing signage? Is this new signage that we're doing? It's the signage uh, packages that were developed for this project need some uh, modifications. Newer, newer, is it new signage. Some, some signs are missing from the pa sign packages that should have. I guess I'm not clear. Are there, there's no signs there now? Or are we changing there, the signs? There are signs going in in the project. In and okay. in addition to that, there were some signs missing that should have been in, should have been included and were not. So we're going and analyzing which signs need to be added to make complete sign packages for the project. So when you normally put up signs on a state highway, is that a shop eligible project or maintenance? Okay, so the normal signs that are there that are existing are shop eligible. This is a sign package that's associated specifically with the project. So it's covered by the project. When the project is complete and the sign signs get hit or we have to do something, then the shop program will come out and repair those. But as part of the project um, component, it is part of the... So, so, so sh new signs are shop eligible components. And so I guess my question is, is there a way to explore having this shop fund some of that because it's quite common for for their shop to contribute for shop eligible components so i think that's one thing we should be exploring we don't have to talk about that more now um the question was raised about contingency i think is it like a five percent standard contingency and is that statewide or is that so five percent is the standard contingency we can go up to ten percent so on projects where we anticipate additional issues we would include uh, maybe a 10% contingency. And so that's something that learning lesson here is we probably should have had a bigger contingency based on the challenges of these jobs and the locations here. So, and and thinking like someone who didn't study engineering, but say economics, there may be a strategy to employ that says, if, if you're going after competitive funds, it's better to have a higher contingency because you can get that money if you're just a normal shop project that that's going through the shop program, you can have a small contingency because you can the, the shop program is like five billion a year. You can always get extra money there. So I think I guess just as a strategy, setting aside the 
the the engineering aspects. I think that's an important thing that that we probably want to look at mo- moving forward, because you know, as the commissioner said, there there there's an impact. We're we're not Los Angeles. We're not we're not Santa Clara County with with, with four measures. We're not you know MTC. We have a, a a very small program, and so these costs really mean what aren't we going to do at some point in the future? And at some point our cost increases are really going to impact our ability to have local match on some of the things we want to do in the very near future. And so I think to the extent that we can do things, Sarah has done a ton of work in um, in, in trying to look at uh, the details of, of the, of the charges really to ensure that that everything is above the board. Cause we also know, you know, Caltrans as, as big as they are, everybody's got a job and they have a limited amount of time to do something. And, it means a lot more to us to to save, you know, a couple hundred thousand, a half a million, a million than it is to an organization with a $20 billion budget. Uh, we'll go to Commissioner Quinn and then we'll come back to you, Commissioner Rodkin. Just for my edification, follow up on um, Mr. Weiss's comment. When, you, when you're setting the budget for this project, is it better to set the sticker shock up front and build in a contingency? Because I'm worried that Number one, there's a cost overrun we can't fund. And number two, there is a a perverse incentive in a time and material contract for someone to provide more time and materials. So how do you get ahead of that so you're not back here every couple months? And I don't want to be redundant, but it's sort of a philosophical question. Would be better off to swallow the full sticker price up front rather than being added on to? So I I think there's a need to... I would say there's a need to be strategic depending on on what the fund type you're looking for. So so for Caltrans, which which has a lot of fund types, if you're doing something competitive, you know, you're probably no one's probably going to care whether you have five or ten percent contingency. And so so getting the money up front in a competitive program makes a lot of sense. Now, on the other hand, they have an, you know this other program, the shop program. It's five billion a year. It makes sense to for them to have a lower contingency on those projects because they want to get as many projects going as possible, knowing that there's always going to be some delay somewhere. So, so it's it, it's better for them to have to, you know, and it hardly ever happens to wait a little bit on a project than to not have a project moving forward. It's just so. I think. There's there's an engineering way to look at it, and I don't know if, how often that gets done to say what's the data and what does that support and where, how much do we go over, but then there's a more strategic way to look at it. What is the fund source we're applying for? And I think that's what we need, you know, as partners need to be thinking about moving forward. And, and the reason I ask is, you know, clearly this commission has significant competing priorities, and it feels a little bit like you know you're in for a dime, you're in for a dollar. At, how do you upfront? get the most realistic dollar value so you can weight the competing priorities aware of downstream for the commitment. Well, and I, so I, I would say that's a challenge and, and that's, that's a challenge for Caltrans as an engineering organization, because um, many years ago, I worked on one program that was having significant cost overruns and, you know, they they would add up everything and say, well, we think, you know, we're off, you know, we're, this is what the trend is. And, you know, we're, we're doing that. And I, I would just step back and look at every one of your estimates in this program has been off by 50%. So I don't care what all the pieces add up to, it's going to be 50% off. And, and, I, and, and, and so there needs to be a combination of that. And I think that that's where as an organization, they've struggled a little bit because they're an engineering organization. Um, but, you know, partnering with them, I think we could, we could have those conversations about, you know, what, what what's the what's the most appropriate thing for the project we're doing now and our funding strategy that goes with it to try to make sure, you know, if it if it's something that they absorb the cost increase, then it could be you know a small contingency that way that we that we could have more risk. But if it's something where we're competitive funding, we're only going to get what we can get, then we want to be a lot more risk adverse in in those cost overruns potential cost of price. Well, the, the, horse is out of the, the horse is out of the barn on this, but I guess the question for Sarah, it, obviously it's not an enviable position to be in where um, one organization decides what needs to be, you know, in terms of control, not 
I'm assuming everybody's doing their best to be cooperative, and that's not the issue here. But but um, where one organization uh, makes the decisions about what's going to happen, and the other organization pays for it, tell us the, the first of all, is there any other possibility of a different approach? And what's the advantage? Of, why did we get ourselves in this situation? Um, and that's, that's not a blame thing here because I understand that there, we want to work with Caltrans and we want to try and be cooperative and stuff. But you know, should we ever do this again? Um, is this a bad way to approach these things? Should we? What, what, what would the consequence be of saying no? We're not going to do any more of these deals. We're going to manage it. Anything we have to make to pay for, we're going to manage it because otherwise, somebody else is deciding how much we're going to pay. So, what's what's the virtue of the way we've approached this? Sure. I appreciate that uh, that question, and you know the roles and responsibilities for the projects are very well thought out. Uh, we actually went to the commission ahead of time and kind of laid out, you know, this is how we envision, you know, the roles and responsibilities. The RTC was implementing agency pre-construction, and you know, having Caltrans serving on an oversight role gives us an extra set of eyes to catch design issues and you know they're the owner and operator of the facility and so they know the highway best right so we're depending on on them there's a lot of partnership and trust um and frankly the way that our organization is structured or has been structured over the years uh, we're obviously challenged with staffing um, and running a major construction program for, you know, over $100 million worth of construction on our major highway would have required significant staffing um, increases. You know, if you recall, it was only two years ago that we hired two additional engineers. I was a one-woman department for the first five years of um, being uh, staffed or staffed to the commission. So um, that was definitely a factor. And our thought is, you know, Caltrans knows what they're doing. They're a great partner. They deliver projects. They build projects all the time. They've already got a department going, you know, that focuses on construction. So we um, entered into the, you know, recommended those co-ops to have Caltrans as the lead. We surely can consider an alternative um, you know, uh, arrangement in the future, uh, but it would require a lot of consideration, additional consideration for how our organization is structured, as well as consultants. We would then be using consultants because if you think about staffing, you know, we hire staff on a permanent basis usually. Um, and um, usually, if I wrote my whole take on, um, you know, staffing and making decisions about whether we should use consultants or use staff. Is it a short-term need? Short-term being, you know, five years, let's say, or is it a 10-year need, right? So um, we think about these things because we don't want staff to be hired for a, a massive project to be delivered. And then when that project's done, they don't have enough to work on you know, that puts us in a difficult position. And so a lot of times with this specialized work and peaks, of work, we depend on consultants as well. So we could, you know, reconsider for the phase three project how that gets delivered, and um, if that's something that the commission wants to, you know, talk about in future meetings. Um, we're obviously open to that. It's just a lot of different changes and balls in the air that we'd have to figure out. And I don't know enough at this point to know how I would want to go with that at that point, but I want to try to understand. You know, how we got in situ and we got ourselves in this. Nobody did this to us. A lot of factors at play, definitely. Um, anything else? I, I don't really have an additional question, but I just wanted to uh, follow up on Commissioner Rotkin's point, uh, particularly given that we're looking at, um, I believe, much more complicated uh, segments of highway expansion. Um, which I don't support. I've been, uh, I, I've continued to vote in favor of these um, uh, agenda items because I feel that, you know, I want to be, uh, you know, collegial. I know that that is a priority for other parts of the county. And so I've, I've said, I mean, I'm not going to um, try to 
uh, hold that up. However, we know that these next segments, particularly the freedom one, is going to, to be much more complicated than this. And I am very concerned about that longer term and what, um, you know, getting into situations like this means for the future. So I, I just wanted to say that I appreciate all the, the questions that uh, folks have asked here. I want to really appreciate um, Sarah and our, our our TC staff for working through this. It, it, reading the staff report makes clear how much um, you know how much work was you had to do uh, to to try to sort through this. I appreciate Caltrans uh, providing some additional information so we can not line by line see what these costs are. Um, but my my concern is, and this is for all of you who are going to be here long after I am on this commission. Um, Really, we need to find a way to work these things out, and you know, and and make sure that we are are not going. Uh, you know, cost overruns are the standard now, but um, reining that in as much as possible. So, just wanted to appreciate the point. Okay, uh, I just have a couple questions. Um, so, being not necessarily familiar with the process. Um, I'm wondering if you could help me understand um, some of the issues here are related to conflicts with trees and light poles and whatnot. Is the site not reviewed before cost estimates are considered? Uh, that would be the designer, so. Okay. Um, the other thing is there are additional unforeseen change orders, but there are also some foreseen. So the, there's the mention of... Um, soil condition in the center median. So given that there are some foreseen change orders, do we have any estimate of how much more we're, we're going to have to be considering in the future? So we have projected out, um, and I think it's also outlined in the report, what we project out, we think we're gonna need based on the, what we encountered in the first stage mm -hmm. and, and projecting that out, and what, what other things we'd anticipate. Analyzed in detail though, knowing that some things will be less because we're in the median, we're not on the outside shoulder. And so when we were able to go through and figure that out, and that's where we're figuring where we're, as we move forward to the next ask, it'll be more dialed in at that point, so yes. Okay, but that's not part of the 3.9 currently. F future, yes. It's future. Is, yes, that three, the total of a 3.9 at this point, it's 3.9. That may, that number will probably continue to come, might come down again. So the staged approach is actually working, will work well for us. Okay. Um, and then that number could come down. Well, we're, there's other things that we're looking at. You know, one of the items I um, in partnership, once again, is that we're, we supply money for, for example, the support office and so forth. And we're taking all of that and putting that back in the contingency, using that for the project funds, uh, not for support of our of our field office. Okay. So all right, thank you. Any other questions or comments from the commission? Seeing none, we'll take this to public comment. Uh, we'll start with those in the room. Seeing no public comment in the room, we'll go to public comment online. Mr. Brian Peoples. Hi, it's Brian Peoples with Trail Now. Um, you know, this was an observation of this, uh, what's going on, which is a good observation. Uh, you know, I first got involved with this organization 25 years ago. I've been regularly coming to this forum for well over 12 years. Thank God for COVID. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, so I find it very um, good that this organization is really f acting like it's their money. You guys are finally acting. You're you're questioning it, and you're feeling the pain. You're it's you're 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 publicly expressing frustration, which I think is a good thing with spending your money. And so I am hopeful that we continue that kind of mentality going forward. Rather than, you know, oh, a million here, a million there for these projects, uh, for unrealistic projects. Because we have to remember what your charter is. Your charter is to improve transportation for the community and doing it in a timely, cost effective manner without, in an eco friendly manner as well. So I appreciate the discussion you are having, and I truly appreciate 
that you guys are questioning the cost because it's you're you're and and you're going to get more pain right as the budgets get cut more and more because the state's not going to have any money. So I just want to express my appreciation for the work you're doing on that. Thank you. Lonnie? Thank you, Commissioners Lonnie Faulkner with Equity Transit. Um, there's still an echo. Uh, extreme budget overruns for highway widening are common but do not result in improved economic returns for our community or climate crisis mitigation. A report just came out from the Journal of American Planning Association stating that the US urban roadway system is overbuilt. And as a result, expanding roadway systems are unlikely to have anything close to the economic benefits that state and federal policymakers hope for. The US spends billions each year constructing new and repairing old roadways. The research finds that the costs of expanding roads in urban areas are three times greater than its potential benefits. And quote, we're stuck in the process of building more highways and widening roadways, even though the economic justifications aren't there anymore, end quote. Organizations like the National CR Club, local CFST, Equity Transit, we fight to minimize highway widening and support prioritizing robust public transit, which has a $5 improvement to local economies for every $1 spent. The National CR Club and the State Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure state that the implementing a state rail network is a primary priority for addressing climate change. The data is extensive and clear. Highway widening is a temporary measure to address traffic, but results in generating far more traffic, which continues to amplify our climate crisis and will impact all of us. Regardless of how inconvenient it may feel, we must challenge ourselves to delve into real data and seek to transition away from funding a car-centric society and instead invest in fast, frequent, dependable, robust bus and rail solutions over environmentally destructive, huge highway expansion widening for day-to-day -day commuting and travel. And as far as moving large numbers of people to and from distances, rail is the cleanest, most energy efficient, safest mode of transportation. Thank you so much. Okay, we have a telephone number, last three digits, 915. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbruner, and what I want to uh, bring to the discussion is uh, in this cost overrun issue is um, an issue that has come to my attention regarding the soils that granite construction has taken from the Capitola Overcross area of Highway 1 of this project and dump them at the Santa Cruz County Fairgrounds. Um, it, it was dumped next to a creek that leads directly to the College Lake area, which is now a water reclamation project for Pajaro Valley Water Management Agency. And um, that it has been brought to the attention only by the public that this dumping was happening Supposedly, it was with authorization of the um, 14th DAA CEO, but he states he is very, very surprised by what has happened. It, a lot of the work, most all of the work happened at night. And so I'm curious now that the state California Construction Authority is coming in and saying that uh, they will need nearly half a million dollars to do analysis of this soil, and determine the impacts on the riparian and waterway leading to College Lake, if this is going to contribute to yet another cost overrun. And um, I hope that you're watching this. It's quite devastating. And um, it's a 30-foot high mountain of soil that has been brought in by granite uh, to the fairgrounds parking lot. I appreciate um, Commissioner Johnson's 
sincerity in in wanting to make sure that the taxpayers are that 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 this project is and its its contractors are being held accountable. The taxpayers deserve to know about this and uh, to understand why these cost overruns keep happening. And I appreciate Comments. very much the conversation that this should be at the front end of the Thank project. Thank you for your comments. And being dribbled in. Thank you. All right. Any further comments online? Doesn't look like we have none. Okay. All right. With that, we'll bring it back to the commission for any further discussion and uh, consideration of a vote. Yeah, Commissioner Koenig. Um, Thank you, Chair. I'll move the recommended actions with the additional direction that at the appropriate time, uh, staff present uh, options to the commission for the phase three project to control cost overruns, including potentially a larger contingency or changes to the cooperative agreement with Caltrans. Second. Second. All right, you get the motion in a second? I see. Okay. All right, uh, we have a motion in a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Um, Great. Yes. I just, uh, things move too quickly for me. Uh, I wanted to follow up on the concern that was raised by the last speaker uh, in terms of the um, dumping of the dirt in South County. Is there a response from staff on that? And what's being done about that? It looks like um, Ms. Steinbrenner has stumped the team here. I just heard about this from uh, from Becky via email, and we've been um, starting to look into it. But uh, the RTC staff's pretty removed from the day to day construction. Um, we can't really tell you much more unless Tim has any more information on on that. But we'll have to look into that and come back if and get back to you. I'd appreciate that. Sure. Uh, hi, commissioners. My name is Jorge Urwaga. I'm the senior um, <clears throat> construction engineer for the project. I work in the field with the resident engineers and the people uh, out there. So uh, what the last call was about was the second project, the phase two, which is in Capitola area. It's not related to the project that we are asking for the for the funds right now. Uh, but just uh, we, we do an extensive, um, so the contractor has to um, so a couple of things. So we have a soil analysis of every soil that is moved outside. So every time that is moved outside, if it's not contaminated, can go to a, a facility like this one, and it has to be an agreement between the owner and the contractor. So we are uh, we're going to look into this, but I, I can tell you if it's not uh, if it's contaminated, it has to go a class one facility, and we we follow that. We have the paperwork for that. So. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We're going to go now to item 28, Climate Adaptation Vulnerabilities Assessment and Priority Reports, our CAVA draft prioritization. Turn it over to staff. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Good morning, Brianna Goodman of your staff. Good Today, my consultant team and I will be presenting the draft final prioritization of the Climate Adaptation Vulnerability Assessment and Priorities Report, or CAVA. We will go over why this study is needed, what metrics went into the CAVA framework and analysis model that produced the draft prioritization. Brianna? Public app, yes. Yeah. If you're trying to share your PowerPoint, it's not sharing. Did, were you going to oh, share it or did okay. you need me to yeah. share? Yeah, thank you for letting me know. No, I can I can try again. Um, it's telling me that it's sharing. Is it working now? It's a it's a blank screen. Something's huh. I see. I apologize. It looks like it's working totally fine on my end. We still don't see it. Hmm. Would you like me to pull it up? Um, yeah, that's fine. You can do that. Give me just a second. The 
just give me a second and I will share it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Can you um, just advance to the next slide, please? Okay, trying again. Uh, we will go over why the study is needed, what metrics went into the Kava framework and analysis model that produced the draft prioritization, public outreach conducted for Milestone 2, and how the model was calibrated based on community feedback. Slide. After the extreme weather and wildfires that have impacted our community the last several years, it is fairly obvious that it, there is a local need for increased climate resiliency. Funding opportunities are beginning to be available to help our community get out in front of these disasters and modify our transportation infrastructure to be more resilient to climate change impacts before they happen, not just pick up the pieces after the fact. A comprehensive system-wide analysis is needed to look at when and where climate change accelerated natural hazards will occur and which of those will have significant impacts. Slide. The future likelihood, timing, and intensity of the climate hazards shown here, coastal hazards, flooding, slope failures, extreme wind, and wildfire impacts were included in the Kaiba model use, utilizing the most up-to-date climate science. Slide. Kaiba is a collaboration between RTC and County Planning, Public Works, and their Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience, or OR3. The Kaiba model includes transportation network segments, culverts, and bridges for both the Santa Cruz County Branch Rail Line and the county-maintained roadway network which we will label generally in this study as transportation assets. Slide. To assess the impact to the community of damage to or failure of these assets, a variety of consequence metrics were considered. These include the number of average or projected daily users, access to critical emergency facilities, and an equity priority population metric detailed in the box at right of the slide. This equity metric includes, oh, sorry, could you go back? <laughs> This equity metric includes components for some for income levels, communities of color, and those living with disabilities, et cetera. I will pass the microphone on to Tim with our consultants at WSP now, and he will walk us through how we put this all together to create the draft COPPA prioritization. Slide. Sounds like you folks are muted. Uh, in an example hazard like debris flow, um, we take metrics about data about those uh, assets, the conditions they're in, um, and the, where they're located vis-a-vis -vis hazards um, to produce uh, a likelihood score. So we take those, those metrics, put them on a common scale, and come up with a likelihood score ranging from 0 to 10. We also do that for information about that asset's role in the in the broader transportation system. So things like travel volume, whether it provides access to an equity priority population. Um, and we do the same for those metrics, put them on, on a common scale from zero to 10, uh, weight them together and come up with a consequence score from zero to 10. So we multiply those two together and come up with an overall hazard uh, risk score, a debris flow risk score of zero to 100. On the next slide, you can see we repeat this process for each of the hazards we're looking at, um, and we average those together into an overall uh, prioritization score. And on the next slide, um, you can see we uh, then take those scores and divide them into five bins of equal widths. And you'll see on the maps that we show, the highest priority scores are shown in red, um, ranging down through orange, um, all the way to blue, which is the, the lower priority. So these are relative risk scores meant to indicate um, areas in, 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 uh, that should be higher priorities for, for looking into potential adaptations. Uh, on the next slide, this is a screenshot of the web app that we um, presented this data in and, and made available uh, to the community for feedback. There was also, it was also presented in a, in a survey uh, as well as uh, underlying GIS data. And Brianna will talk a little bit more about the outreach we did um, with these draft uh, results. Thanks, Tim. Uh, the Kava team went out to the community for feedback on the draft prioritization results throughout June and July. 
uh, a great amount of effort would put towards reaching people where they already were out in the community, particularly in South County, and ensuring that all outreach in print, online, and in person was available in English and Spanish. Slide. This effort yielded results with nearly twice as many South County community members engaged with the CABA project for Milestone 2 compared to Milestone 1. These charts are also available in your agenda packet as attachment one. Slide. In the online survey, respondents explored a map uh, that you saw a moment ago of the Kava output showing the color-coded overall risk scores Tim discussed earlier. Users were able to click on individual assets and answer a few survey questions. Driving was the most common way respondents indicated their mode of travel would be impacted if the asset was damaged, though walking was a close second. Slide. We received feedback across all transportation asset types, uh, types, though nearly half of the responses were in regard to roadway segments. Slide. Respondents were asked to provide reasons why they would change the draft prioritization. 85% of the responses suggested an increase in the priority level um, from what the model was showing, with the number of users and uses an evacuation route being indicated the most often. Comments provided in the other option, as well as comments received during stakeholder meetings, also indicated that the draft prioritization model was not showing high flooding likelihood at locations that are currently flooding during winter storms. Uh, so we knew that that metric would, would need to be modified as well. Uh, now I'll pass things back to Tim of WSP to go over how the model was calibrated based on this community output. Based on all that feedback, we made a bunch of changes, but I'll just highlight some of the major ones here on this slide. Um, the first was just changing how we're looking at uh, relative travel volumes on roadways and not relying uh, solely on the travel demand model for uh, for travel volumes on lower, uh, less traveled roadways. It was important to look at some of that more manually to understand whether segments were dead ends with with relatively few um, trip takers on those on those roads. We also uh, accounted for, but tried to better account for potential evacuation routes based on community feedback. Um, there's evacuation uh, route network planning that's going on right now at the county. Um, evacuation routes are, are highly dynamic and shift based on the nature of the event, particularly during a wildfire. Um, but we use proxy metrics to try to capture uh, which, which roadways are more likely to be evacuation routes. So, Arterial or, arterial or collector roads, um, those located in wildfire severity zones, um, and those with relatively long detours. Um, we also heard during the workshops that uh, having uh, for for uh, community members with disabilities being outside of an area, uh, an urban or rural services area, was particularly difficult during a hazard event. Um, and so to bump up the priority of of roadways um, and that serve those those populations, we looked at um, those outside of those service boundaries and in lower mobility um, communities. Um, in terms of the flooding likelihood uh, that Brianna mentioned, we we did some work to better calibrate with um, with how things are on the ground by combining riverine and coastal flooding together and also removing um, some of the wildfire related metrics from our from our flood likelihood scores. Um, given that a lot of those roads are on the coast where there's there's relatively low wildfire likelihood. On the next slide, you can see how our consequence metrics ended up um, being weighted for uh, the, the roadway assets on the left and the rail assets on the right. So the highest uh, weighted metrics for the roadway assets were uh, the volume, uh, the detour time, followed by whether or not an asset provides access to an equity priority population and it serves as an evacuation route. For rail, um, it was relative travel volume and equity priority population. You can see on the next slide, um, this is a map of just the consequence score. So it doesn't uh, consider likelihood, but the relative consequence scores, same color scale, um, as before, so the higher consequence uh, roads in, in assets in, in orange and yellow colors here. Um, and on the next slide, uh, the same for rail, where you can see a lot of the um, higher consequence rail, railroad segments in the eastern portion of the county um, where the, the rail is higher, expected to be uh, more heavily traveled. Um, the next slide shows the overall asset prioritization score. So combining that consequence with the likelihood of hazards occurring, uh, you can see in the staff handout um, the, the list of top uh, top scoring uh, assets for the different asset classes. 
for the roadway system, you know, we generally found um, high volume roadways in rural areas with um, that are exposed to hazards with without a lot of detour options tended to drift towards the top of the list um, in the results. And for the rail as well, unsurprisingly, you know, more of the higher priority segments were in the eastern portion of the county, particularly those exposed to um, coastal flooding or, or erosion and those that pass through equity uh, priority populations. So I'll hand it back to Brianna to wrap up. Thanks, Tim. Uh, so next steps. Uh, in a moment, we will be asking for your input on any final modifications to the CAVA model. After approval of this draft final prioritization, the CAVA team will begin to put together the final report, which will be published for public comment before the winter holiday. Uh, and then we move through final approval at the January RTC meeting. Slide. Then what? <laughs> the COVID analysis and mapping will become part of the data maintained, referenced, and updated by County OR3, first through its incorporation to their upcoming local hazard mitigation plan update. The COVID output will also be incorporated into the RTC's 2050 regional transportation plan and used by both county agencies and RTC to seek state and federal resiliency funding. Slide. And that's it. Thank you so much, and we're ready to take your questions. From the commission, Commissioner McPherson. Uh, yeah, it's very detailed, uh, in-depth report, and one that's very much needed for our area. But um, and you've really categorized and included a lot of uh, different aspects about how we can make this better for everybody in the county. Is there anything that's lingering though that uh, that uh, would help us in the pursuit of getting? Uh, grant funds in the future. I mean, I know you've addressed uh, with your report in depth of what you think is needed, but you, is there anything that's left hanging over that you said you might think right now that, hey, we need a little more time or add this to it, uh, any specific area or any uh, kind of venue of transportation? Brianna, do you wanna go first, sir? I can have my thoughts too, but. I'm, I'm probably gonna say your thoughts too, so you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yeah, to open to suggestions for sure. I think, um, you know, we look really at where, where the highest priority assets are. I think a, a key next step is what are the costs of adapting those, you know, particular those higher priority assets? Um, what's the risk? Is it, is it worth uh, mitigating? Yeah. And I would um, add to that that, you know, there are a couple of places where data was not available. Tim mentioned earlier the um, evacuation route planning in the county that's currently underway. So as you know, that becomes finalized, it's something that we could uh, use to update the prioritization um, as other additional um, facilities such as, you know, potential uh, rail transit come online. And instead of just, you know, using really rough um, estimates for uh, how many people will be using each segment, we will have a better idea of uh, the actual utility of the locations. And um, there's also going to be some updates to uh, equity priority population definitions in the 2045 RTP. So that's our, sorry, 2050 RTP. So that's also a place where we could do some um, modification to the inputs that might result in a slightly different output. Yes, uh, Commissioner Rotkin and then Commissioner Schifrin. This, this might seem like a insensitive question or not politically correct or whatever. I, I live in a, huh, my disabled son lives with me in my home. Um, but I raise a question about this idea of giving double counts for dis, uh, in terms of providing resources for disabled folks who live out in rural areas and at the end of, you know, some road in the middle of nowhere. And um, I understand that, you know, that's in, like in Bruce's district or somewhere else. But the, the question is, is, is it a good public policy to sort of spend the limited resources that we have to divert a, a, a disproportionate share of them? And then again, it's not a big issue because it, it doesn't affect the final outcome in huge ways. But it, does it make sense to um, spend money to fix an evacuation route out to a fairly remote place because a disabled person may choose to live there rather than in the urban area. Um, I mean, the same question comes up around bus service um, and how that works. So I'm curious what your thoughts are about that. I mean, if I understood correctly, that's what you're saying is that there'll be, you'll get a double count 
terms of how it, the impact if it's a disabled person that's being potentially served by an evacuation route or something. Do I, first of all, do I understand what's proposed? And secondly, what are your thoughts about the question I'm raising? Yeah, so I th I think they, they're counted a, a bit higher and it's, it's based on census data too. certain thresholds of um, populations with disabilities or other mobility challenges. So it's looking not just at, you know, individual, you know, single individuals, but but at, you know, the broader um, population data available through the um, American Community Survey. Um, and we're also, you know, I think it's just one small piece of how we put together the scoring as well. Like, you saw the, the really the, the the travel volume is one of the highest metrics. So for roadways, um, you know, even that might, might not have a lot of low mobility populations. If it if it had a, a very high travel volume and a very long detour, it was going to get towards the top of the list. Um, so a lot of different factors are weighted together based on you know most of what we heard during um, during outreach on those consequence metrics. And um, I would just add to that, yeah, for yeah, additional for clarification that um, it's not so much double counting as just one additional point out, out of 10. So say a uh, road segment already was receiving six total equity priority points, it would just bump it up to a seven um, and wouldn't necessarily overwhelm the entire count of the other components that go into the equity prior prioritization metric. It just is a small bump for locations that have a higher density of people with mobility concerns. Um, what we were trying to capture is, you know, if there's a person who utilizes a mobility device to get around who's living in, say, Live Oak and their road, you know, goes out, there's a tree over it, there's many opportunities for them to go around and otherwise not, you know, there's um, some redundancy and they could possibly even, you know, evacuate safely in their chair. Um, that is not something that you're going to see at the end of a rural road in, um, you know, Lompico or something like that. And, you know, those kind of um, situations could potentially result in uh, fatalities for persons living with disabilities in uh, rural areas. So we were just trying to capture um, uh, what we were hearing. The North County Focus Group was real uh, concern for potential lives lost. That's a very helpful clarification. I wanted to follow up on uh, Commissioner McPherson's question. Um, maybe I didn't understand the answer, but I thought he had asked whether going through this whole process is going to and identifying priority projects is going to be helpful in terms of accessing grants for um, implementation. And that's what, what I thought was sort of a major purpose of going through this whole thing. Is that not what is that what's intended? Yeah, absolutely. I'll let Brianna chime in as well, but I um, mean, I, we structured it in a way. I mean, one of the things that for a lot of the resilience focus grants, at least that you, you'll be asked for is, you know, how did, how did this, did you do a vulnerability assessment and how did this, um, this particular asset you're trying to improve, um, you know, how, what were the results for it? You know, so being able to show that, show that outreach was done um, about those priorities, um, you know, show that uh, the reasoning and the rationale behind, you know, why this is an important uh, asset to improve, you know, all that information and, and thinking about, you know, from day one, we it's the, the focus of the, um, one of the focuses of the project has been, you know, how do we um, position uh, assets to go after funding um, down the road? So that's definitely been a focal point. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that answers my question, so I'm fine. All right. And um, to, fo to follow up on that point, uh, just one additional piece of information. Since OR3 is interested in hosting this data and this map, um, you know, we are we are writing this report right now to be able to check all the boxes to be um, to be able to apply for this climate resiliency funding as it is currently structured. Uh, in the future, if there are different or more uh, rigorous um, rules we need to follow in order to be able to be um, able to seek that funding. We'll be able to modify um, the model like I spoke of if like there's additional data that needs to change or be updated to align with the RTP. That's something that we can keep doing um, so that we will continue to be uh, eligible in the future. As well, this is uh, Dave Ring, Director of the Office of Response Recovery and Resilience. So one of the amazing timing um, uh, serendipitous elements of this work is that we are going to be kicking off, as Brianna said, the update to the local hazard mitigation plan. That is a FEMA required document 
that's going to be the first multi-jurisdictional. So all the jurisdictions in the county, including some special districts, will be part of that update. By comparing this work with that work, it strengthens our access to federal grants, right? To, to do some of this resiliency work, whether it be in the coastal zone or whether it be in the mountains, will require state and federal dollars in particular. So by integrating this work with that local hazard mitigation plan and being able to demonstrate to our grantors that it's that this important work is in both of those documents in the process that we undertook to get to both the results of this work as well as the end results of the local hazard mitigation plan update will definitely strengthen our opportunity to seek grant funds at the federal level. Yes, go ahead. One thing I didn't see, and hopefully you can educate me on, how do you weight access to critical resources? So I'm going to assume that roads near fire stations, ambulance stations, hospitals are weighted differently. And I didn't see that in the equation. Yeah, that was uh, one of the metrics we looked at for the consequence um, score. So critical facility access, um, you know, whether uh, a roadway or, you know, assets along that roadway provided access to a critical facility was one of the, the metrics we looked at. And what, what are the critical, appreciated, what are the critical facilities that, that are weighted? Um, it, I, it was a whole slew of uh, critical facilities in the, um, in the, in the county's data set. I think, yeah, certainly hospitals, all the ones that you mentioned would have been included. I think schools as well. Um, I don't have the encyclopedic uh, list off the top of my head, but yeah, there's a bunch of them. Thank you. Okay, just a quick question for me. Um, the staff report mentions that the project will not identify preferred resilient solutions, but rather the order in which the work should be completed. So my question is, who will be identifying preferred resilient solutions? Is that us? Is that OR3? Um, are we just looking at each of these priority projects one at a time and determining what their solutions are? Um, or are we going to wait and see what funding is available and then give that to each project according to its prioritization? Can you just expand on that a little bit about the difference between identifying the preferred solutions as opposed to just determining which one should be addressed first? Again, Dave Reed, OR3. So, so the work um, that was done on the county maintained road network will inform work by our community development and infrastructure department, as well as OR3 in seeking those grant dollars. So this is a piece of the puzzle. This is not the comprehensive decision making, like we will take every road rate rated at this level and go and seek grant funding for that project, but it will inform other prioritization analyses that the that this community development and infrastructure department is embarking upon to go then identify the priorities and, and identify the projects. So generally speaking, there would be it would be a relationship between the county government and community development and infrastructure and or, or three in seeking some of those grant fundings rather than an RTC thing. However, there are obviously the branch rail line under your purview. But for the county maintained road network, we probably wouldn't necessarily bring something to the RTC to answer your question on the who. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, no further questions. We will bring this out to public comment. Seeing none in the room, we will go online. Mr. Brian Peoples. Hi, it's Brian Peoples with Trail Now. Um, Really appreciate the work you all are doing on this assessment. I think it should have been done years ago. Obviously, when we're talking about investing millions on infrastructure that is essentially right on the ocean, right? We have to understand, is that practical? Because most often it's not. When we talk, when we're seeing what's going on with the sea level rising, um, with just recent storms, right? Uh, one thing, though, I will comment on, you know, my day job, I'm an engineer. I deal with a lot of metrics, and, and sometimes people do these metric models that are pretty elaborate and actually just don't really deliver, okay, what, so what? And so I think we need to be careful of creating, and I'm not saying you're doing, to be honest with you. I just um, want to make sure, in, as Dr. Quinn mentioned, you know, the weighting value of specific assets is probably a very key metric driver, right? Um, I'm not sure if the equity or the color of population is a, a viable metric, for example, 
I mean, what you're doing is you're looking at what's our existing infrastructure, what's our future infrastructure, and what's the projected storms coming in, what's the the impact on that infrastructure. So I'm I'm not truly convinced that that equity part of that metric equation is viable. I get it, I get it that you know that you want to make sure that everybody is beneficial from it. But but anyways, again, I just wanted to say I appreciate the work you're doing and we should have done this a long time ago. Thank you. Mr. Barry Scott. Still muted. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, this is Barry Scott. I'm in Aptos, and I want to thank uh, Brianna and and her team for bringing forward the uh, the Kava project and, and commissioners. And I am uh, I'm super grateful for the public outreach and events that were held. I attended both uh, uh, a Watsonville and a uh, and a, uh, I've forgotten now which city uh, another uh, open house was held in. And I was part of a uh, focus group as well. And, you know, it's tremendously important that uh, this work is being done for having having completed this process uh, sets us up for success in grant applications in the future. And I was really uh encouraged by the fact that the rail line is being uh, taken seriously. The uh, the railroad is a, an essential part of our resiliency assets uh, as we face increasing risks of fire, slides, earthquakes, and so forth. We all know how how easy it is for the highway to become in, unusable in the face of emergencies. Uh, it happens frequently, and uh, and I do believe that a greater number of Funding streams are going to be available for our rail line. Uh, we already have freight and passenger rail potential grants that can be used to uh, improve and use our line. But the the availability of it for uh, climate response and recovery resiliency generally uh, can't be overstated. So again, thank you, Ms. Steinbrunner. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for this report. I am encouraged to see there is um, a good amount of focus being put on fire evacuation routes, especially in the rural areas, and hope that the county will um, reinvigorate the roadside mowing program that has pretty much gone by the wayside to keep these evacuation routes safer and with better uh, fire protection, sensible space. The, the issue that um, troubles me in this is that the, the Santa Cruz County Grand Jury's recent report about the road condition in the county um, mentioned that there is a plan really to allow those roads in the county that are not in good shape. Many of these probably are evacuation routes to uh, deteriorate because there's no money. And in the long term, the county would abandon them. So that bothers me a lot, being a rural resident myself and knowing many people who live in the mountains, probably on some of these roads that are destined to be abandoned, yet the people are still out there and the emergency response is still needed. So I hope that that piece of the uh, Santa Cruz County Grand Jury investigation findings and the county's response will be incorporated into this plan and addressed. Thank you very much. Okay, seeing no additional comments online, we will bring it back to the commission. Any further discussion or else we will entertain a motion. No, no action is being recommended. I think if there's, I think a motion is needed. Do we not need to, uh, wasn't there a milestone we needed to approve? Um, yes, uh, 
that this this draft prioritization uh, um, does need to be approved. Second. Yeah. Second. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Uh, uh, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We will move on now to Thank you. sorry, scrolling down to our next item. Uh, zero emission passenger rail and trail project project mile two engagement and California Public Utilities Commission coordination efforts update. Hi. Hello and good morning. Actually, good afternoon. Um, Bradley Gerbrandt of your staff. Thank you, uh, Chair Brown and commissioners for the opportunity to present uh, to you today on an update for the zero emission passenger rail and trail project. And I've got um, Mark McLaren and Tiffany Mendoza, part of the consultant team on the line as well. So they will be providing some portion of this update for the commission. Um, I'm going to attempt to share the screen. So we'll, we'll give that a try. And if you guys can see the screen, let me know. Just want to make sure that you're able to see it. Look, looks like from the camera, actually, it looks like you guys can see it. So I will continue. So today is a, as I mentioned, an update. It's going to be an update on the Project Milestone 2 engagement, as well as an update for the Commission on the California Public Utilities Commission coordination efforts. Um, we do not have a um, uh, recommended action. This is a presentation with an update on the status of the, of the project. As a reminder of this project, this project is new high capacity rail Riley, I'm trail. sorry to interrupt, just, oh, go. Yeah, we, we lost your slides. Yeah, they were showing uh -oh. um, and then they weren't. And, and just a real quick IT update, um, in order to address the echo on Zoom, I have to mute the room. And so when the speaker on Zoom is speaking, then our mics will go on mute. So apologize for that. Understood. So let's see, I will stop the share and share again. Maybe I'll share the screen and have it on there. We'll try it this way so I don't potentially click off of it. So um, as a reminder, the project is looking to uh, implement high capacity passenger rail that is zero emission passenger rail on 22 miles of the branch line as well as complete segments um, 13 through 20 of the MVSST coastal rail trail and uh, phase two of segment 11. So that would add additional 13 miles or 12 miles of coastal rail trail to the, the system. Um, I wanted in this this first slide here to note that there were several um, comments received on, on this item. There one particular comment voiced that the project includes public participation. Public comments uh, be made available for public viewing online in order to ensure transparency. Uh, so as a, uh, we have already addressed this issue, uh, luckily, or as, a, as part of the plan for the project, we have uh, uh, making the public comments available as part of the process. And we have uh, the, the milestone one and milestone two public outreach summaries, which provide a very detailed uh, summary of what occurred in each of those milestones is publicly available on the RTC's website. So let's see, our, looks like um, you guys still see the, the slide, so that's great. So as a reminder, this is our project schedule. Um, in October 2023, we kicked off this project um, to begin the project concept report, which will define, evaluate, and develop a project rail and trail build concept that could be advanced into future projects. And this is scheduled to be completed in spring 2025. And following completion of the project concept report, the commission will have an opportunity to move the project forward into preliminary engineering and environmental documentation. And then if there's project approval, then through uh, final design and right away. And on this slide, we have a summary of recent commission actions. In February of this year, we had a public hearing and um, presented the 
project's preliminary purpose and need statement. And in April, the commission adopted loading guidelines for railroad bridges, repairs, and replacements. In May of this year, the commission adopted design standards for um, the cross sections, design cross sections for preferred, constrained, and unconstrained scenarios um, for the rail and trail facilities, and also adopted recommended horizontal setback guidelines from the branch line right away for new structure. And in June, the commission held a public hearing on the initial conceptual alignment and the analysis of conceptual rail transit vehicle types. And that brings us to milestone two engagement summary. Um, before we get into um, the summary of that provided by Tiffany Mendoza of our team, um, I wanted to mention as I, as I did earlier, attachment one for the staff report for this item includes the detailed summary of this engagement process that is available through uh, as an attachment to the staff report and also available online at uh, the RTC's website. So I'll hand it over to Tiffany. Yeah, thank you, Riley. Um, again, everyone, thanks for having me. My name is Tiffany Mendoza. As Riley mentioned, I am with HDR and I'm supporting your staff on the community engagement efforts for this project. Our outreach for Milestone 2 was conducted in June and July. Um, as Riley mentioned, that began with the public hearing at the June Commission. We also held two in-person open houses, as well as an interactive online open house, and conducted briefings and presentations with approximately a dozen agencies, committees, and other stakeholders. Across all of those outreach efforts, we had more than 120 participants at the two in-person meetings, which were held in Watsonville and Santa Cruz and more than 1,200 users participated in the online open house. From those, we received a total of more than 650 comments and feedback points from the public. And that included more than 400 comments just on the initial conceptual alignment maps alone. And I did wanna mention that the online open house that was um, launched in June, it remains open and available online. And that's at the www.zeppert.com address. All of the information that was provided and maps are still available. However, we have closed the feedback options while the project team works through the comments and next steps. Riley, if you wanna to go to the next slide. All right, I'm gonna share some of the key feedback we heard. Um, as we mentioned, feedback to, or milestone two focused on sharing information and collecting feedback on two key topic areas. Those included analysis of potential rail transit vehicle types and the initial conceptual alignment. So I'm going to detail the key takeaways we heard from both of these, starting with the rail vehicle types. Um, before I jump into that, as Riley mentioned, we do have the full summary of all of the feedback received um, attached to the staff report today, as well as on the project website um, on RTC's site. So getting into the key takeaways we heard on the vehicle types, we heard from the community a preference for multiple unit vehicles, followed by light rail vehicles. And the third vehicle type that we presented was locomotive hauled vehicles, um, which definitely had less preference from the community. Um, as part of that preference, we did hear from the community that they're very interested in a vehicle that is efficient, reliable, and quiet, as well as a vehicle that provides flexibility. And when we say flexibility, we're referring to flexibility with connections to other systems, flexibility to interact with freight service, as well as to accommodate growing capacity. We also had a strong community preference that the vehicle type be consistent um, with flexibility for and eligibility for state and federal funding opportunities. Next slide. All right, next I'm gonna share the key feedback we heard related to the initial conceptual alignment. We received a lot of specific feedback on the trail alignment and configuration. 
This included a, des a desire to keep the trail as close to the branch line corridor as possible, as well as concerns about the trail width. We also heard an interest in trail connections, both from the rail system um, as well as the community. We heard from the community the need to ensure uh, maximum funding opportunities. And we also received a lot of feedback regarding station locations and connection to the statewide rail system. In relation to those station locations, we saw a desire from the community for both the Santa Cruz and Watsonville stations to be located in close proximity to downtown districts. In Watsonville, we also heard a desire for connections to existing and planned local trail networks, as well as to South County area beaches. And lastly, we also heard a lot of general feedback from the community related to grade crossings, safety and noise impacts, as well as a lot of site specific community concerns and suggestions um, that our project team has been working through. And Riley's going to go into a bit more detail on a few of these items. So I'll hand it back to Riley. Thank you, Tiffany. And on your screen here, you'll notice that there are a couple items that are uh, have asterisks and we're going to go into some detail on those specific items and because they came up um, as important items through the public engagement and stakeholder and um, partner agency work. So first is maximizing eligibility for state and federal funds. This was a common theme for what we heard through engagement milestone number two. Um, the community, the stakeholders, the uh, partner agencies are very interested in making sure that we have you know, maximum ability, maximize, maximize our ability to maintain eligibility with um, funding sources out there. And on that note, the, the, we wanted to give a little bit of a briefing on, on what those funding options currently are, kind of the, the um, landscape of, of funding, both state and federally, currently for rail transit. And of the, the biggest item is that current and state and federal funding is weighted heavily towards developing new or improved inner city rail um, passenger rail services both the state rail plan and the federal department of transportation priorities, um, they align with that goal to uh, provide new and, and improve and expand inner city rail. One of the bigger programs in this space is the federal corridor ID program or the corridor identification and development program, uh, which was authorized by the infrastructure investment and jobs act. And the Federal Railroad Administration, or the FRA, has delegated the authority to administer the Corridor ID program, which is, in a nutshell, uh, intended to develop, sustain, comprehensive inner city passenger rail planning and development for the United States. And that program, as one of the key concepts, is to set forth capital project pipelines that are ready for federal funding. Um, and this is going to be the primary means for directing federal financial support and technical assistance for the development of new and improved inner city rail, passenger rail throughout the United States. And as a note, only inner city passenger rail is eligible for this program. And the state rail plan um, aligns with the corridor ID program policies and, and goals. Um, the Caltrans is a sponsor of the corridor ID program for California corridors in the program. And the Central Coast Corridor, which includes the extension to, uh, to Santa Cruz on the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line, is part of um, one of these five corridors. As mentioned in Director Weiss's um, director's report, staff continue to coordinate closely with Caltrans, including on this project. And on this note, Caltrans has offered to, on a future date, provide a detailed presentation to the commission on the corridor ID program and staff is working with Caltrans to schedule a date for this presentation. But in a nutshell, um, I can summarize really briefly. It's a the corridor ID program for the FRA is a three-step process. Caltrans is currently in step one to define the scope, schedule, and budget for a service development plan. Sometime in early 2025, Caltrans will move into step two, of which is developing that service development plan. 
and moving into that next step um, includes approval um, with the FRA on an approved scope for the corridor and the corridor projects. Um, and that would be the time for, um, you know, the, the commission, for instance, to be either in or out, um, you know, to, to express con um, support for being in the program um, or for developing something outside that program. Um, step three of the program, the corridor ID program would be going into preliminary engineering in NEPA and FRA would provide 80% of funding for those step three projects. And once in the program, then you do not need to reapply for steps two or three. It's not a competitive program once accepted into the program. I um, mean, it's again, it's the primary method um, for FRA bringing funds to these, uh, these projects. Um, so aligning the branch line passenger rail service plan with the state rail plan and with the, the, the federal transportation priorities would in a nutshell maximize funding eligibility and technical support through state and federal programs. And that was a, a big, big key takeaway from the milestone to engagement. Moving on to another key takeaway is um, on the screen here is the Santa Cruz and Watsonville proximity to the downtown districts. The um, partner agency, and during the partner agency briefings, we met with both the city of Watsonville and the city of Santa Cruz, um, expressed the importance of optimizing locations of the plan stations for passenger rail service, particularly near the downtown locations, and the desire to locate them at the historic depots um, was expressed and this was consistent with public engagement as well. Locating the stations within walkable distance to the downtown district would obviously provide um, more accessibility and equitable transportation and would accommodate planned future growth. Um, it, locating the downtown stations um, will be at the historic depots it is being analyzed in ridership and operations modeling um, as we continue to develop the and um, refine the conceptual alternative alignment. Both of these locations have operational challenges and, and specific site challenges that the project team is currently assessing in more detail. Um, in a nutshell, being on the north leg of the Y downtown Santa Cruz, for instance, um, makes an operational challenge for, for vehicles that would have to come in and then reverse direction. And in Watsonville at the historic depot location, um, that is located on a curve. Locating a station on a curved portion of the track would be incompatible with level boarding systems, which it creates an operational challenge um, and is not consistent with the milestone two or milestone one purpose and need statement that was developed. Options for avoiding, mitigating, and minimizing these challenges are being investigated by the project team and we will continue to engage with uh, the city staff as well as um, you know, during milestone three engagement with uh, the public and stakeholders on the location of, of the, of the um, stations for, for the entire relay, but specifically as well for the ones near downtown. And the third key takeaway um, are the connections to South County beaches and local trail networks. So consistently, that was a, a big theme that came through the milestone two engagement process. Many comments were received with particular support for a multi-use trail along West Beach Street to provide connections to existing and planned trail networks, as well as to uh, for access to South County beaches. In response to this, um, the project team developed a conceptual alternative exhibit, which is um, there's a link in the staff report to those those exhibits. They're hosted on the RTC's website. They were too large of files to include as attachments to the staff report. Um, but in a nutshell, three conceptual alternatives with conceptual cross sections are shown in this exhibit. And for each alternative, segment 18 would provide a West Beach Street alignment that connects to the coastal rail trail site, segment 17B. The three alternatives presented differ on where segment 18 connects back to the, the rail corridor. The three alternatives shown are being connections at Lee Road, at Ohlone Parkway, and at Walker Street. City and county staff 
we en engaged with during Milestone 2, supported developing these exhibits as a means to further review and assess these potential alternatives, and staff seek, plan to seek input from both the county and the city on these conceptual alignment alternatives. The input received will be incorporated into development of the revised conceptual alignment that will, com that will comprise the key component of the Milestone 3 engagement materials. Staff would also like to highlight that several public comments on this staff report and on the, the uh, subsequent one were made relating to these exhibits and the alternatives presented for, uh, for segment 18 alignments. Staff and the project team are currently reviewing these comments and we'll be reviewing how we can incorporate those comments and, and respond to them um, in the development of the refined conceptual alignment. And, and options for delivering the segment 18 um, uh, rail trail segment, including these alternative alignments will be discussed in more detail in item 30 of today's agenda. Um, and that wraps up summary on milestone two public engagement. Um, and that brings us into the, the second theme of the presentation today, and that is on the California Public Utilities Commission coordination update. Um, and just as an intro to this topic, the, uh, the project team is responding to the commission's June 6th public hearing um, direction, um, where the commission directed staff to return at a later date with more discussion on uh, the CPUC authorities and regulations and horizontal clearances required by the CPUC. So the, the public, the project team was able to connect multiple times with the CPUC staff through these past several months um, and through these discussions with the CPUC, as well as through um, the project team's own parallel research efforts, um, the project team has developed a draft memorandum outlining the CPUC rail safety authorities and roles. This draft memor memorandum is included as attachment three to the staff report. Uh, and in the following slides, we'll discuss the CPUC authorities and roles, as well as outline how they relate to the zero emission passenger rail and trail project and more broadly to the branch line. So um, to summarize the CPUC regulatory roles, the CPUC authority is derived from the California constitution and from the California Public Utilities Code. Federal law also establishes a close relationship between the state, uh, the states and the FRA. Under the California's Public Utilities Codes, the CPUC inspectors are federally certified to enforce both state and federal requirements. The CPUC's regulatory role spans the life of a rail project from planning through design and then um, into operations. CPC regulatory authority over rail safety processes vary and include both design review and field verification. On the following slide, the different units of the CPC's rail safety division and their respective roles uh, will be presented. And as a note, um, the project team um, and RTC staff are coordinating with the CPC and that coordination is, is ongoing and, and continues. The project team will um, continue to engage with the CPC and um, as the project development progresses and continue to provide relevant updates to the commission. So on the slide are the different rail safety division um, and their roles. So under the CPUC, um, there's the, the rail safety division unit uh, has four different, or rail safety, the division has four different units. They are the rail crossings and engineering branch, the railroad operations safety branch, the rail transit safety branch, and the rail safety risk management and engineering safety sections, which um, provide special assignments. All three of the um, top three units touch this project. Um, rail crossings, they deal mainly with the evaluating safety of the public rail crossings and review proposed construction um, of those crossings. The rail safety, op rail operations safety branch is federally certified inspectors of freight railroads. And, the, and railroads that comply with both federal and state railroad safety regulations are under the, the purview of this branch. And then the third main branch is um, the authority of all of the, of the CPC over 
the rail transit agencies. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Mark McLaren, um, our project manager from the HDR consulting team to give a little bit more detail on um, how those affect the project. Great. Thanks, Riley. So um, a couple of conversations have taken place as we've come to you before, as well as we've, we've been out uh, meeting with stakeholders and holders and in the public meetings about the role of the CPUC and the areas for which they have jurisdiction and, and how, in fact, they engage uh, in a project as, as a project advances through the process. So we're going to talk on a couple of subjects here just very briefly to kind of help provide some clarification to that um, as it relates to the process and how this works. And starting with um, the discussion of the CPUC and clearances. So the Rail Operations Safety Branch, as uh, Riley mentioned, is a group uh, that- Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Riley, your screen switched over. Oh my gosh. Oh. Yes. Thank you. That was okay, a taking care of. of your screen that I was doing there, I think, Riley. <laughs> um, so the Rail Operations Safety Branch provides uh, safety certifications for new rail service and compliance of existing rail operations. Um, and in that, uh, one of the first areas where the RTC most recently has had engagement with them has to do with at-grade crossings under General Order 88B. Uh, which includes design review, review and approval before construction. Um, and so in your case, with the work that was done previously and is being done with the rail, the rail trail program, uh, there are at-grade crossings that are affected by that project. And so your staff has gone through the process of working with CPUC to get general order hey, Martin, ADHB. Yes. I'm, I've been let note they don't see our... Um, Slides, so I'm going to. Oh, okay. Uh, they're showing a there again. Okay. It looks like they still don't see it. Um, okay, I'll try sharing a different way. Okay, it looks like that might have solved it. No. Apologies. Okay, it looks like that. Got it. Okay, um, let us know if the we need to try again. But it looks like we got the uh, the screens up. We good. I think so, Mark. Go okay. Ahead. All right. So just to uh, backtrack just a little bit here. So the Rail Operations Safety Branch uh, is one that provides safety certifications for new rail service and compliance with existing rail operations. And uh, one of those key areas is enforcing uh, the areas or the requirements for at-grade crossings uh, under General Order 88B, which is one of the general orders that was in the previous table that Riley shared with you that shows some of the general orders and the department, the branches of the CPUC that has oversight for those areas. And the, the General Order 88B um, requires both design review as well as approval of improvements or changes to accurate crossings prior to construction. So this is a process that RTC staff has gone through as a part of the rail trail to gain approval from the CPUC for changes that will be affected at some at-grade crossings because of that project. The clearance requirements for railroad operations between the crossings, so once you get 100, 150 feet away from an intersection and an at-grade crossing and you're on a tangent of the railroad between intersections, uh, that is actually a requirement that falls under a different general order, which is General Order 26D. Uh, the difference between these two is that um, the requirements of 26D set minimums, um, and those minimums are at the discretion of the inspectors uh, that go out and review work once it's been completed in the field to acknowledge or to verify that the railroad is safe for operation. 
And so typically the CPUC recommends at this stage of early stages of design, that design be done with an exceedance of the minimum requirement uh, to ensure that once something's been constructed in the field, if there are any concerns about other obstructions or things that are within the right of way, uh, that it has still been designed in a way that it is safe for operation. The difference between the two divisions in this conversation is, is that under the general order 88B at at grade crossings, the CPUC is required to review the design and to approve uh, those designs before they're constructed in the field. In the case of general order 26D between the at grade crossings, the CPUC is not required to review the design. And in fact, the final verification is actually uh, done in the field after something has been constructed, at which time their inspectors go out and verify that the, co the tolerances and the, ver the uh, clearances that have been provided along the alignment of a railroad are in fact in their determination safe for operation. Um, it's also important to understand uh, that in meeting those clearances in the design and construction of a new railroad facility, ultimately, while the CPUC has the authority to go out and approve it, uh, the responsibility for meeting those clearances in the design and construction of the railroad facility falls to the owner. So in the case of constructing a railroad between the at grade crossings where the uh, design has not been reviewed, has not been approved in advance by the CPUC for construction. Uh, they require or recommend, I should say, a risk-based design approach that includes exceeding the minimum requirements so that once it has been constructed, there are not concerns about those clearances when they get in the field because that's ultimately at the point that they will make a decision. And if they make a decision in the field that something has been designed that they feel is not uh, meeting their safety requirements under the intent of the general order, they can require the owner at the owner's cost, go back and redesign or reconstruct elements of a project to ensure that they're going to be compliant under the general order before they provide the certification for the railroad to operate. Awesome, thank you, Mark. Um, there's a really good, um, so providing this summary for our clearances and how the CPC um, roles and authorities relate to those as we do our, our project design. The last thing to, to touch on our CPC rail vehicle operations and just to briefly summarize those, that's the, the third branch we mentioned earlier in the, in the presentation. Um, and the general practice is what is called 2G buffering safety requirements. Uh, for rail vehicles that interface with great rail operations like we have on the branch line. Um, in a few cases, the CPC offers waivers for passenger rail vehicles, and we can go into more depth on that if there's questions about that. Um, but it is, uh, well, it is available, it's uncommon, and in all those situations, the CPC requires additional safety measures um, to then um, meet their safety requirements. Um, so that brings us into the next steps, um, which I'll briefly get into um, just where we're at, and, and then we'll wrap up. Um, so on the screen is um, we're, we're between milestone two and three, and milestone three will be um, bringing to the commission and the public in the fall, and then wrapping up with milestone four at the end of the project. And that wraps us up to the end of the presentation. Um, I will stop sharing and we are available for your questions. And just so you know, we, we don't have audio yet. I do now. There we go. I have three questions. Um, Great. First of all, do we know for certain what the P CPUC standards are for clearance under 26D? There's been some discussion here about, you know, do you need eight feet or 11 feet or you know between the rail trail and the edge of the train you know, are those standards clear do we have certainty about that or is that something that's in play and we'll have to find out later the answer is yes and no um so yes we have certainty as to what is in the general order um the general order states the absolute minimum is eight and a half feet and and mark if you want to jump in um 
feel free to do so, but I, I think it, in summary, eight and a half feet is the minimum. Um, however, with passenger rail service, um, the CPUC um, states that that is the minimum requirement and that often safety requirements exceed, needed for passenger rail service exceed the minimums. And so um, as a general practice, the minimum for passenger rail service in California that will meet CPUC safety requirements is 10 feet. Um, but that is um, to any obstruction on, on the rail line. And when there's curves, they increase that safety clearance requirement. And as a, a rule of thumb, the industry practice is to design to 12 feet. Um, and that would allow for the uncertainties of where different, and at this stage, I should say the industry practices the design to 12 feet at this stage, the conceptual stage, um, because we don't know where some of the equipment is going to be needed um, and uh, some of the other requirements are going to be needed by the system. So um, that is how we're approaching the, the process. We're doing a, a risk-based approach since there's that uncertainty with the CPUC and um, the cross-sections adopted by the commission um, meet the intent of what we're trying to achieve with those um, uh, that risk-based approach. As a follow-up question, as we're designing our rail trail and its distance from the, the tracks um, or where the tracks are now in some cases moving slightly and so forth, um, so are we therefore assuming that generally we're looking for 10 or 11 feet and would in some conditions try and go and ask for, I don't know if it would be a waiver or what, to go back to the actual required standard of eight and a half feet? Uh, how are we handling that? I mean, you're making a design now and we're actually building the trail before the final thing is done. So we'd hate to put the trail down and then come back and discover, oh, that should have been 11 feet. We didn't leave enough room or here we could have had the trail be wider, but and we built it differently because we assumed the worst case scenario, but maybe we could have got away with eight and a half feet. So how, how are you handling that in a practical way? Understand. So we've had a lot of discussion with the, the trail team. So there's been quite a bit of coordination on that effort. Um, and Mark, I'm going to um, let you talk about how we are um, going through some of those steps. But um, when it comes down to the what we're trying to do, boots on the ground with the, the trail teams and some of the, the conflicts that we have, um, Mark can touch on some of the, the resolution efforts that we've been doing, um, but we're looking at the system as a whole and, and those requirements um, and seeing where would they have the ability to make changes, um, where it makes sense to make changes, um, and then maybe some uh, different approaches where there's conflicts that um, may be too challenging to resolve um, at this stage. So I'll hand it over to Mark. Sure. Thanks, Riley. So as I mentioned a moment ago in the CPUC's role, this is where we uh, a project, any new project has a challenge. Uh, because what happens between the at-grade crossings, uh, when we talk about the clearance, there's no waiver or process to go through at this point in a project uh, to get something approved uh, that prior to it being constructed. And so that's the reason why we look at uh, designing to a minimum that's greater than what the uh, general order requires, uh, because as Riley said, the unknowns that are along the alignment. Um, the challenge we also have at this point is you have segments of the trail that are at a high level of design. A lot of those details have been worked out. We have a trail project that it's a five to 10% level of design right now, for which a lot of those things are still to be learned or, or unknown as it relates to where railroad equipment and other things are going to go. So what we're doing is, is working with the rail te the trail teams right now. The rail team is looking as overlaying the alignment that has been taken through the public process that's continuing to be refined and looking at, with the trail design as it's currently designed and finding the areas where we see uh, conflict that we believe there's an opportunity to make some adjustment early to mitigate the, the need in the future to have to go back and do repair or do changes to the trail to get the two to work within the right of way. There are a few of those areas where uh, because of things that are unknown at this point, 
for example, what the, the abutments of a bridge might look like in the future or other things that we're not quite sure what the right-of-way needs are going to be for those elements that we're gonna to have to identify and continue to work through in the future. But to the extent that we can identify things now uh, where there's an opportunity to change the rail alignment, the trail or both, to best accommodate what can be done within the right-of-way, that's the goal of what we're trying to achieve. Fair to say that you would be having some discussions with CPUC staff at, when you come up to these particular situations to say, what are they thinking or how, how would, again, they're not gonna give you a decision until you're done according to what you've said, but can you have a productive discussion with them about how they might look at something more in, in a very concrete, uh, specific situation? Mark, go ahead. I was gonna say, yes, we're, we're having consultation and, and discussions with the branches. Uh, individually to talk through those issues. Uh, so to again, to the extent that if we're doing anything that might affect an at grade crossing, we can get very specific feedback uh, in the places where we have designs where we've got questions between the at grade crossings about the clearances that we can sit and have a conversation with the CPUC about what some of the possible steps might be to best mitigate that. Again, uh, because to that point, it's our intent as well to have something as the design advances that we're not creating conflicts that would be uh, a, an issue with the CPUC on clearance under that general order when once a railroad has been constructed. Thank you. Uh, this, my second question has to do with um, the crossings and to what extent we're looking at the possibility of, I think they're called hospital zone crossings where you, they don't have to blow the whistle, um, you know, the horn um, at every crossing. To what extent in this design are we talking, again, informally with the CPUC or what the potential is? Uh, I mean, you can't maybe every crossing can't be made that way, but to what extent is that a feasible thing? Because I think people have raised reasonable concerns about, you know, where there are crossings that are pretty close to each other, that horn goes off and for 15 blocks, you can't have a conversation outdoors in your backyard. I understand. And that is one of the things that we're looking at as we look at the, the operation and the planning for this project and quiet zones have come up uh, as a part of an, or interest from the community as we've gone out and we've talked to the public and we've talked to stakeholders. Uh, one of the things that it's important to understand is just as we talked about the ultimate construction of the railroad um, in the CPUC's eyes is at the uh, responsibility of the owner. Uh, those at-grade crossings where quiet zones are imposed become the responsibility of the municipality uh, because ultimately the things that are done to uh, protect that intersection, to make sure that it can operate in such a way in the crossing of a public roadway uh, to ensure public safety without the use of the horn, uh, that becomes part of the jurisdiction of what the municipality has a responsibility for. So through this process in our discussions with the cities, we will be continuing to have that conversation about what their interest is and in understanding of the responsibility that they would have to take on that, that part of an operation. My, my final question has to do with uh, the, the um waivers situation that was mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. To what extent is it possible now to get any kind of understanding about the possibility of um, in relationship to getting a waiver for freight con conflicts with freight that have to do with temp temporal separation? In other words, you know, the freight only runs three hours or four, you know, four hour mm -hmm. segment or something during the night when we're not running passenger service, to what extent is it possible to have conversations? Is it too, is it premature to start conversations now about getting waivers for that kind of a situation that would allow us to have freight and passenger service on the line where, you know, we make some absolute agreement that we're not gonna run freight when, whenever the passenger trains are running. Mm -hmm. so to, to that point, um, there's a, a nuance in, in what a waiver is that I think would be worth explaining. And then Mark will tell us more detail about that and how that process works. The waiver relates to the um, CPC rail vehicle operations um, and their general order requirements for crash worthiness. Um, the waiver relates to the vehicle. So you can apply to the CPUC for a waiver to operate 
a vehicle does not that does not meet the CPUC crash worthiness um, requirements, which are which are called 2G buffering safety requirements. Um, so there is a process for doing it. Um, the but it's not about running freight versus passenger rail on the service uh, on the lines. It's more about the vehicles that are operating on the uh, on the service. So does the vehicle meet and, and um, is it approved by the CPUC or does it does it not? And then if it, it doesn't, there's a process for the waiver. And Mark can explain a bit more about um, some of those aspects. Sure. Um, and I'm going to go back to uh, something that Riley touched on a little earlier in the presentation as it related to the uh, corridor ID program uh, from the Federal Railroad Administration and the, the intent to keep this project in conversation uh, eligible for the most opportunity as it relates to federal funding. Um, under the corridor ID program, the emphasis is on inner city passenger rail. And so when Tiffany talked through the vehicles that were discussed with the public and the public's interest, for example, in multiple units, uh, multiple units are a, a technology uh, that has been accepted to interline with the freight railroad, the Union Pacific, for example. Uh, so it provides, has the capability to provide inner city service. Um, that's critical if we want to maintain our eligibility for the pot of money that's there for inner city service. And that lessens the need for the type of waivers or other things that would be required for that vehicle to operate in a shared corridor with freight, for example, along the Santa Cruz branch line. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't need temporal separation uh, to allow the passenger train and freight to switch along the Santa Cruz line. There's a lot of other things that go into that, such as the type of control that's happening along the line, uh, what extent uh, protection is being provided at at grade crossings. There's a whole number of things that would go through that. But that is a conversation that we will be continuing in our early discussions with the CPUC to make sure that as we talk about what it means to have connectivity to an inner city system, what type of train we would use to provide that service, understanding the things that we would need to do to ensure that we would have the exemption or the approval when necessary to be able to operate safely within the corridor. So yes, yeah, exactly. simple answer is yes, that con conversations continuing, but part of it to Riley's point is defined on uh, the type of vehicle and the type of funding you want to make yourself eligible for, uh, particularly in the federal programs. No, I think that's definitely a priority is, you know, getting a vehicle type that we get we could get funding for. Uh, thank you for your answers. They've been very helpful. I know they're a little technical, but um, <laughs> at this point, it's really helpful to get this, this level of uh, detail to understand what the potential is for this whole service. Thank you. Sure. Additional questions? No? Okay. Uh, with that, we will bring this to public comment and we'll start with public comment in the room. Seeing none, we will go to public comment online. Mr. Brian Peoples. Hi, this is Brian from Trail Now. So the CP, CPUC's role is to protect the public. You all are trying to have 60 trains a day going 60 miles an hour, speeding through our neighborhoods. It's absolutely ridiculous that you would think that you would try to get a waiver for that safety. They're there to protect us. And you're virtually building a new highway through our neighborhood. That's what you're trying to do. And the idea of eliminating the horns for quiet zones, that would result in somebody dying. It's basically uh, another nail in the train coffin that we're seeing. Um, it's really embarrassing that you spent millions on a trail design that doesn't even set, meet the setback requirements for your train. That's a great example of the argument you guys were having with Caltrans about wasting our tax dollars. You essentially designed a trail that doesn't even meet your train requirements. And you actually went to the state of California and got a grant money, and you're looking to build that trail that doesn't even met, meet the setback requirements. This has been the problem. We've been telling you for a decade that the setback requirements, that the train and trail would not fit. You never believed us. Well, now this is the evidence that they don't fit. And you continue 
Mr. Commissioner Rotkin continues to see, well, can't we make it fit? How can we make it fit? It doesn't fit. We don't want 60 trains a day speeding through our community. Point. That's basically what we don't want. We don't want that. It makes no sense. It doesn't help the environment, doesn't help traffic, and it just makes our trail take longer, which we've seen, costs millions more. I mean, we could have had a trail to Watsonville if you guys had listened to Guy Preston. This is honestly why Guy Preston quit. You all know this, because this organization has poor planning. Thank you. Ms. Steinbrunner. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. I appreciate this information. Hearing that um, the industry standard is a 12 foot wide clearance for, for passenger rail is very interesting. And to the extent that it's that as Mr. People said, we're trying to fit it all together. I think we need to try to fit it all together and to reduce the width of the trail to accommodate the safety of the passenger rail and the needs of the public. Case in point is the area in Aptos Village where virtually half of the Bayview Hotel and Trout Gulch Crossing property, their parking lot would be taken away in order to make a, a 10 to 12 foot wide trail. That's even gonna take more now hearing that the train rail has to have 10 to 12 feet clearance. So what I wanna say is please look at alternatives. For example, at the Bayview Hotel area, there is a, a good bicycle lane on both sides of Soquel Drive. Eliminate the trail and make only a pedestrian sidewalk that would take less room. Do those sorts of things in the constrained areas to protect the ability to have passenger rail. We do need that in this county and I support that. I'm happy to hear that um, the, the multiple unit is being, being favored. I did attend the open house in Watsonville and the following night, the presentation at the Watsonville City Council wherein Councilwoman Ari Parker implored that there not be light rail because of the incompatibility with the freight service that is paramount in Watsonville. Thank and you for your comments. for the connectivity. Just, just one more thing, please. The, raising the, the train bridge across the levee must be examined because that. the levee will be raised and it could impact. Thank you for your traffic. comments. Ms. Seagull? Seagull. Seagull. Good afternoon, this is Dana Siegel for Friends of the Rail and Trail. Um, I just wanted to give kudos where kudos were due and really thank the team that has been working on this project. Um, we, you will see in the next uh, item, uh, item 30, that a number of the comments we made pertaining to segments 17 and 18 um, of the rail trail were incorporated in the new designs being presented today. And we wanted to thank the team so much for offering a fully protected trail for segments 17 and 18. Um, it's so important for our community and we love to see when um, that full safety is, is taken um, into account and being designed uh, right before our eyes. So thank you again for all your work on this project and thank you for your such good due diligence and in taking into account all of the various public comments that you hear. Barry Scott. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to say I am, uh, I just get more and more excited as I see more progress made here. Uh, and I'm confident that we're going to see rail transit implemented in this county. The, the reasons for it grow every 
month, every year, certainly more funding, more technology. Tesla just <laughs> yesterday's news, Tesla launches world's first electric, all electric giga train. I mean, uh, the possibilities are, are, are manifold. I want to thank uh, uh, all, the, all the research that's been done here. Um, when it comes to the obvious conflicts and competition for space between the trail and the rail, I want to remind commissioners, um, not that they need the reminding, the, 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 this is a railroad. This has always been a railroad. It needs to stay a darned railroad. And there are hundreds of miles of street that can be used for truly safe. If we are willing to give up a little bit of space for cars and trucks and parking, we can have fabulous and, and arguably better bike routes in different sections of our county. Uh, I, I'm, I'm baffled uh, by sometimes a, an insistence where it may exist that the that the uh, trail be immediately next to the tracks and surrounded by fencing. So, you know, where there are opportunities, like I mentioned earlier on Park Avenue, um, Sumner Drive and Aptos is a case. Watsonville has sections. There's, there's opportunities to to take the uh, move the trail away from the rail so that we have the maximum flexibility to do the very best rail transit plan that we can and obviously integrated with the, the trail routes and connections. So I just want to thank you again, and uh, I look forward to, to further uh, presentations, hopefully a state rail plan and corridor ID plan presentation for the public would be helpful. Thanks. Bonnie Faulkner. Thank you. Sorry, it's going to take a minute for the button to come up to actually address the public. Um, thank you for this excellent report and for moving forward with supporting one of the most energy efficient, safest, equitable, cleanest forms of transportation of moving people distances. Uh, that is rail. Aside from the warning horns, today's electric rail is also far quieter than automobile traffic. And of course, automobiles uh, come with a whole slurry of negative effects, including toxic tire dust that um, goes into our air, water, and soil. Um, the noise that actual medical reports and being in the medical field myself, I'd be happy to share journal articles that talk about the impact of the noise of automobiles on our hearts and our health. Uh, long term and short term. Uh, the notion that commuter train will go 60 miles per hour through the densest part of the communities is really hogwash. Um, as we know, trains can slow down and then speed up during the um, the areas of the community that do not have dense population. I was really surprised on my recent Amtrak train trip to Chicago to the DNC on the Empire Builder, where there was zero apparent buffer between the train tracks and, that was moving quite fast and the public beaches. That was kind of interesting and exciting. And I've seen in Europe and Utah commuter trains that have minor distances between the rail and the trail. So I know it's doable and I do appreciate the work that this team is doing to take seriously the safety and the importance of future of rail for our community to address equity and the environment and our economics. Hope that some of you look at the data on the economics here and for our future connecting us to the very important state rail network. Thank you so much. David Dean. Uh, yes, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I uh, wanted to um, thank uh, the uh, presenters for uh, giving us so much detail. I very much appreciate the mention of the corridor ID and the state rail plan because um, so many naysayers say that there's no future in rail. And you know, those of us who are actually interested in transportation and public transportation realize that rail is the future. Um, I also wanted to um, make a note of the fact that this is an existing freight railroad. There is existing freight business. So we must consider that and protect that business that already exists and that is growing. 
Um, and therefore, we may have to make some compromises. Alternative three looks much better to me because that predicts the um, the uh, rail spurs and potential new rail spurs for for the facilities that exist along the um, existing corridor. So alternative three um, would still allow for that freight service and uh, for expansion of that rates, freight service. Um, I would also like to say that I'm very grateful that the uh, um, um, visuals provided showed protected corridors for the cyclists, concrete barriers to protect those riders from cars. This is the one of the biggest uh, problems. We have so many streets and so many cars. Please protect the railroad we have and take a little bit of space away from cars. Thank you. We have no more speakers. Thank you. Seeing no more public comment, we will bring it back to the commission for any further discussion. There's no vote on this item. Any further discussion? Okay. Like this, uh, consultants for the report. Yes, thanking the consultants for the report. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple quick uh, remarks. Really appreciate the updates on, um, you know, especially the the clearance requirements and being verified after construction. I think it's a really important thing to note that if we miss the mark, we have to do the work over because we're not going to find out until afterwards if we if we missed the mark. Um, I also am, am grateful for the updates on public engagement. It's an important aspect of this pro of this project. Um, obviously. Uh, here at RTC, we have a lot of transition and changes on our hands in the coming months, but perhaps early next year, uh, I would like the commission to consider the potential formation of some kind of community working group as an, an addition to our community outreach. Um, and I bring this up because I'm currently in my day job part of the community working group for the BART phase two Silicon Valley extension. And in my experience there, I found it helpful in receiving updates. I share those updates in my professional networks through my daily work. We're asked to support grant funding, et cetera. And so what I imagine for our project um, is essentially relevant representatives from stakeholders interested in advancing our zero admission zero emission passenger rail and trail project. Um, I think it would make efficient use of our staff time by consolidating meetings with community stakeholders rather than holding many one-off meetings. It allows our working group members to be good stewards of accurate information disseminated into our community. And I think if we could get representation from agencies like CPUC and Caltrans into the conversations with our community working group members, they can hear directly from those agencies rather than through us or through our staff reports. Um, I think this would be helpful again. I know we've got a lot going on um, in the next couple months. And so obviously there would need to be consideration at some point of how many members, the cadence of the meetings and all that, you know, potentially can be considered early next year, but it's something um, that I think would be uh, important for this commission to consider. Okay. All right, we're moving on. Uh, we are at, yes. I have a question. Yes. Um, my smartwatch has said it's time to stand about three. Yeah. <laughs> um, is there any way that we could just defer the next, I mean, last, you know, last month we had six hour meeting mm -hmm. and now we're, I think we're into four and a half. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a good practice to have this long of a meeting. You know, there's, there people are, have not eaten. Um, there's, you know, I, I'm, I guess I'm more than willing to listen and, and so forth. But do you think it's really good practice for us to have these type of meetings where they go on intermittent for forever and ever? Uh, I certainly don't think it's good practice to have meetings that go on forever, for, forever and ever. But um, aside from that, Commissioner uh, Brown, you have a comment on that? Yeah, I um I agree that the the length of meetings it can be um you know challenging for the commission and for members of the public as well as our staff. Um but we have these items today uh calendared, um agendized and I think it's disrespectful to our staff who is prepared to speak to us on those items to then um just uh say we're going to defer it because it's more at lunch is more important. So um, I, I support trying to find ways to, you know, get 
make the meetings manageable, but I um, I think we should continue and complete the agenda items we have before us. It's one more uh, and then a closed session. And I would say that, um, you know, we have a role in that too. And long speeches often extend the meeting for hours. So uh, for, among commissioners. So thanks. I, I think we should keep moving. Thank you. I just want to say it's a mischaracterization. I think lunch is more important than the uh, business that we're doing here, but whatever. Equally important, maybe. No. Um, yes. The risk of prolonging the meeting, I'll just say, I, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, I've read the staff report, uh, seen the, what we're going to have presented and so forth. If it just comes down to the commissioners understanding it, you could have a meeting done in uh, half an hour. But if then we immediately be have the public out here telling us like, you know, what the hell are you guys up to? What's going on? I'm in the dark. So it's, that's the problem. You want to try and be transparent and available to the public. That's the cost of it. And I, I certainly share the sentiment Randy expressed, you know, all of us but look at the time and I'm a, an older person with, uh, you know, like say <laughs> biological needs. So I understand the difficulty of a long meeting, but it, it, I, I don't know that what the alternative to it really is other than, you know, simply cutting two items in a hurry and then therefore not letting the public know what we're up to. Yeah, Commissioner. Shepard. I would propose two alternatives. Uh, one is to consider having staff provide lunch. Uh, it's not un, un no. We, have, we we do have lunch Six today. Yeah. And two that our staff be required to attend the meetings. We wasted a bunch of times because of technical difficulties. We have to come to the meetings. I think it's appropriate for the staff and the consultants who were paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to to attend the meetings in person. Uh, this idea that we're having staff reports from people, staff members who God knows where they are, uh, and we're trying to get to see what they're doing, I think that's inappropriate. Um, there's no reason why the staff can't attend our meetings. Understandable. I think we should also consider that will require that all of our items be presented at a time certain so staff knows when to be here. Um, but that's conversation for another time, I think. Um, for now, I think we should move forward. If there's a desire for a break before we do so, we can do that. If not, let's let's power through. And then right between this and our closed session where there is lunch, we can take a break for stretching and bio breaks and all of that fun stuff. Thank you, Chair. All right, yes, thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, commissioners. Luckily, I do speak quickly. Um, the item before you is to provide an update on segment 18 of the Coastal Rail Trail. This was requested by you at your June RTC meeting. Since that time, RTC staff has been working closely with the city of Watsonville and other project sponsors to discuss development of segment 18. Um, the discussion in the prior item about looking at alternative alignments for segment 18 is a product of those uh, discussion and collaboration. Um, by way of quick background, um, segment 18 is located on um, between Lee Road and Walker Street in the city of Watsonville. And as envisioned in the Monterey Bay Sanctuary, Sanctuary Scenic Master Plan, it's aligned within the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line. Uh, the city of Watsonville developed the preliminary conceptual alignments, uh, excuse me, a portion of that project of segment 18 uh, was delivered in 2021. And the project has been divided into phases to support project delivery. Uh, the city of Watsonville did move forward and develop conceptual alignments for the other two phases. Um, attachment one is an exhibit showing um, the different phases of that project, not to be confused with what was presented in the prior item. Um, so we, the city of Watsonville developed those uh, alignments, but did not advance these phases into the next phase of project development, in part due to uncertainties regarding the potential future passenger rail station location in this area and complexities with the project design. Rather, RTC staff recommended that the alignment of segment 18 be further evaluated in your zero emission passenger rail and trail project, um, which as we mentioned is looking now at an alignment for both segment 18 within the Santa Cruz branch rail line, as well as an alternative route along Beach Street. Uh, the strategy that RTC staff has been pursuing for development of segment 18 um, is to include those pre-construction activities as part of the zero emission passenger rail and trail project. Um, so you've seen that work coming forward and we'll be seeing a refined alignment as part of milestone three. The next step once the project, uh, the, the alignment is completed would be to advance uh, segment 18 as part of the Zeppert zero emission passenger rail and trail project and move into the environmental phase of that project. 
Another option for RTC is to advance development of segment 18 as a separate project. This is described as option two on in your staff report. Under this scenario, RTC would recommend that work to identify. And um, we still work to wait till the alignment for segment, the preferred alignment for segment 18 was completed um, before advancing into that environmental phase. Uh, consistent with our strategic plan for Measure D, RTC staff and the commission could use local funds to leverage state and federal funds for construction of this project. If we um, funded the initial work for pre-construction with um, local Measure D funds or other RTC discretionary funding. This item before you also provides you with an um, inf information about other priority active transportation projects within the city of Watsonville. We do have Murray Font who's here, for Assistant Public Works together, uh, Director for the city of Watsonville, to provide a brief overview of some of those high priority projects. Uh, he does have a presentation to pr um, provide, but um, Director Weiss suggested that we may defer that presentation at your discretion. And we could also offer to provide those slides to you at a later date. So. Um, would you like to pursue with the presentation um, from the city of Watsonville? Okay. <laughs> no? Yes. no. <laughs> I, I will defer to you on this one. No. Okay. Um, for your information, attachment two does list all of the um, active transportation priority projects that were identified by their staff. Um, including an alignment of an, um, improvements for bicycle and pedestrian facilities along Beach Street that would be complementary to the alternative segment 18 alignment. So with that, uh, today I was looking for your input on um, options that were provided for advancing development of the Coastal Rail Trail uh, segment 18 or other um, segments in and around the city of Watsonville, and also for you to direct staff to prioritize future transportation future allocations of RTC discretionary funds to the city of Watsonville priority bicycle and pedestrian projects that you see on that list. And that would be as part of their fall 2025 consolidated um, call for projects. That concludes my report. All right, thank you. Commissioner Montesino. Yes, um, so um, under the, you know, um, uh, alternatives uh, analysis, so, um, it's here where we make our comments about, you know, uh, you know, the alternative plan or or continue on the uh, path to nowhere. Um, I would, I would <laughs> staff would appreciate your input on what direction you'd like us to pursue in terms of development of segment 18 and and f funding for priority active transportation projects in the city of Watsonville. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, personal comments, we need to do the alternative in order to make, you know, um, you know, this is a priority for our community because, you know, it's a, a twofold, uh, you know, going uh, um, uh, the direction that we're heading, whether we do a station there, it's going to take years. And we're not, uh, um, and the, the alternative going, going through towards beach, you know, provides an avenue not only for, uh, you know, rail component and, and trail, but also access to, uh, you know, the beach, you know, because currently, you know, people with that, uh, there's no bus, we have a beach, you know, you realize, you know, in the community, we have a beach and we don't have access to it where there's a, a road, how many people, you know, that's in shambles. You know that ne that needs some attention, but there's no walkability. There's no bus access, so uh, uh, people are missing out on uh, on a uh, on a you know short distance to a beach. You know, so I you know I preferred. I don't know what the you know the previous uh, the previous slide had attached, but I, uh, as I printed them, I don't know which whether it's A, B, or C. I uh, I couldn't tell. But you know, the uh, to me, the preferred alignment would be, you know, uh, you know, discontinuing the um, the trail to nowhere, that's uh, as I call it, and, and just keeping along from the rail line all the way on Beach on, on Beach Street, beginning at Walker. Yes, and options. Okay, um, thank you. And just a reminder, or I don't think uh, we mentioned it, but we plan to attend the City Council meeting in Watsonville on September twenty fourth to present those alternative alignments as well and obtain input. And we've also met recently with the City of Watsonville Vision Zero team staff and obtained their input. Thank you. Yeah, Commissioner Rotkin. Well, I think it kind of goes without saying that we should follow the lead of the people from Watsonville about what they want. Uh, I mean, I, I could look at this and try to think what I think would be the best, but I don't live in Watsonville and don't have to deal with it. So that's my first comment. You said that we should use Measure D funding to move this up, if I understood your comment. Is there sufficient funding there to do that? 
Um, we would have to return to you as part of our five-year, or you could direct us today to return to you as part of the five-year plan update in November to program funding for that project. And as part of that, we would do additional research to, to determine what type of environmental review would be needed and update the cost estimates. And I would expect, um, given what, what the um, project footprint would be as the alternative, um, we, we would have sufficient capacity to program additional funds to begin that process. I'll make a motion that we. Uh, oh, saying, uh, we're, 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 sorry. All right. Uh, does someone down here? Yes, Commissioner Mayor Fisher. Yeah, I um, I support the staff recommendations, uh, but I take exception to the recommendation that we quote prioritize uh, the future allocations and RTC discretionary funds. I let me be clear. I fully support uh, allocating and reserving these funds, and I thank you for your report on the South County tra uh, trail segments, but the ATP uh, funds should be allocated from the reserved uh, within the Measure D activity transportation program, not within discretionary funds. I think that's really critical. As this commission learned in recent meetings, the Measure D ATP uh, fund has a total capacity of, uh, I think, $174 million uh, over the life of Measure D. And we've already allocated $74 million of that, of the total for mid and North County segments, uh, with a small amount going to the segment 18 in Watsonville. Uh, but the, the Measure D ATP fund is where we told the public that we would uh, fund maintenance for the rail trail corridor, and we would use the fund to leverage outside grants to build out the, the segments of the rail trail. Um, the RTC staff has told us uh, that it will cost around $66 million for rail trail maintenance over the life of uh, Measure D 2016, and that the outside grants uh, to build out the rail trail submits need a minimum of 20% of that local match to be successful. Uh, that puts a real stress on us. Um, Given that the rail trail segments are now costing around $25 million per mile, plus the $66 million for the maintenance, uh, we'll need a capacity uh, left uh, in the ATP fund to make sure that we fulfill our promise to the voters uh, to maintain the corridor, but also to ensure the South County gets its equitable percentage of the Measure D ATP funds. Um, so if we are sincere about making equity a priority value here, we must make sure that the South County has money reserved for its rail trail segments within the Measure D ATP funds, uh, not discretionary funds. I think that's critical that uh, those two distinctions be made uh, before I approve this. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Schifrin. Um, well, this, some of that was a little contradictory. We want to help South County, but we don't want to use these funds. But yeah. my understanding was that when you when the staff report talks about discretionary funds, they're talking about the funds from the active transportation. Was that the intent? Um, thanks for clarifying that, Commissioner Shivan. That was not the intent. So the RTC discretionary funds I was referring to are what comes through the Consolidated Grants Program, which is typically made up of the State Transportation Improvement Program funds, as well as the Regional Surface Transportation Program funds. So you're not talking about Measure D funds from other categories. You're just saying that other funds that the Commission applies for from other grants could be um, uh, allocated to a South County project. So typically every two years, RTC receives has a consolidated grants program and local jurisdictions submit applications for projects to RTC. The most recent um, call for projects was an adoption of the project list was last fall. So we'll be expecting to have another call for projects. Um, they, we usually combine whatever funding sources we have available just to streamline the application process. And they're typically um, the discretionary funds that we distribute to local jurisdictions through that program are federal funds, regional surface transportation, um, or TPX funds, as well as the state transportation improvement funds. It was about 26 million um, that were distributed last cycle. So I would certainly agree that um, under, with Measure D funds, we need to keep within the categories that have been established. But in terms of applying for discretionary funds, I don't think at this point the commission should uh, prevent or agree not to allow uh, applications for particular projects, particularly South County um, projects of one sort or another. 
So I, I think it's sort of a clarification of what's going on here is not uh, there isn't a request to take money from uh, the highway fund, Measure D highway funds, and put it into um, into the rail trail uh, or trail. But there is the ability to, for the commission to consider applications for projects, any kind of projects that are eligible for the various federal and state funding. That's correct. And we typically receive um, grant applications from all of the local jurisdictions um, and distribute the funding based on performance-based criteria. So a prioritization, what that might look like is if a city of Watsonville submitted grant applications that were highly competitive, um, the commission could opt to prioritize those projects in the city of Watsonville. So um, I understand that it's not appropriate today to uh, for the commission to recommend allocating uh, funding for um, any particular project in, uh, in, in in the Watsonville rail trail segments. But it would be appropriate, I think, or at least that's my question, to um, direct staff to come back with the uh, update of the five-year plan to include funding for a South County rail trail project. Yeah, and I want to be clear what we're talking about is then for the next phase of particularly of segment 18. So when we're talking about the available resources, um, we'd be looking specifically to try to see if we have capacity to advance segment 18 through the environmental and, and into the next design phase, but then apply for fed, um, state funds. The idea here would be if we could prepare segment 18 prior to the active transport state active transportation plan cycle for their next um, grant funding cycle in with applications due in June 2026, we could then pursue construction. And my understanding is that we're talking about a one to two million dollar course for doing that. That's what we have we have estimated. Um, I think now that we have some you know direct communication from um, Commissioner Montesino and we'll get input from the city of Watsonville, we'll be able to refine those estimates for the type of environmental review that would be needed. So I'm hoping that the commission would be willing to support directing that when the five-year plan comes back, there be that kind of allocation to move forward with the segment 18 project. So, uh, question. So, uh, what can we do both a, a, under ATP and a consolidated grant? You know, because that gives us a better opportunity to be more successful in my, in my especially around this corridor uh, that is greatly needed and, you know, uh, to, make, uh, to make it more viable. Did you, your, the question is, what could you do? No, so, could you do oh, both, oh. ATP and consolidated okay. grant. I mean, the, the, the consolidated, I don't know if I understand the question, um, but let me try to, to answer. So, so, so what I'm asking is, uh, currently you're saying that, you know, we're, we're discretionary grants, cons, uh, uh, consolidated grants opportunities of what the intent was. Um, um, uh, uh, Supervisor Mark Person said, why not ATP? you know, uh, um, alignment, you know, money. So why can't we do both? Uh, thank you for clarifying. Um, based on prior commission action to fully fund the um, cost overruns for segments 10 and 11, and knowing that those similar challenges will be faced with segments eight and nine, there would be insufficient measure D funds to fully deliver um, segments in and our coastal rail trail segments in and around Watsonville. So this is a strategy to take a portion of one of those segments and advance it through um, the project approval and environmental document phase. The farther or further developed a project is the more competitive is at the state level. Now you're hitting all my buttons, you know, so you're putting me against 10 and 11 so versus Watsonville. It, it, That's unreasonable. If I can, I would say the answer is yes, to some extent, right? So, so we, we, we have indicated our commitment on, on the majority of the measure D active transportation funds, but there was a small amount that, that, you know, when we had those conversations in different scenarios, there was about 10 million that's available. So, so when we're talking about using Measure D to advance segment 18 to make it more competitive, it's a, it's a small amount of that. So it, it's a piece of that 10 million. Um, so we can do that. We could also do, as if the commission wants to, prioritize the, the Watsonville projects as a part of the, a, a discretionary program. So yes, we can do both to some extent, but we can't fully commit to segment 18 
with Measure D, you know, all the way through construction without undoing some things. And, so I, I, and I, that I understand, but yeah. if we can get two millions out, uh, uh, out of that, uh, you know, ATP, you know, that gives us, you know, it gives us, and then we can, you know, continue on the consolidated, you know, uh, program. So it makes it more viable. Yes. And sooner project to be ready. Mm -hmm. That's so, so to Commissioner Montesino's point, if I'm understanding correctly, we can move forward with the two million from ATP funds, and then potentially direct staff to support the City of Watsonville in submitting a competitive grant for discretion. Because you specifically said it would need to be a competitive grant, and it's hard for us to prioritize something that we haven't seen yet. But we could ask staff to support the City of Watsonville in submitting a competitive grant for discretionary funds, and in the meantime, until that time comes we can support 2 million in our measure DATP funding for segment 18. Yes, my question would be though, when you say support the city of Watsonville, what does that actually mean? Are, you, are, are we saying we're gonna somehow prioritize? The so, environmental impact. Well, well, I mean, so the, the environmental, I guess, I guess setting aside that the, the, the measure D for, for environmental is a small amount. I, I think we can do that unless someone kicks me under the table and says no. Um, in terms of supporting them, I, I just want to, like, are, are we talking about staff resources to help them develop an application? Because, because it, we, or we can say, find a way in a competitive program to, to support that because you can do that. You can say, well, we want to ensure that, that, that a, you know, that, you know, something in, in, in areas that we haven't funded as, as as much gets gets a higher higher score there's ways to, to work the competitive program like that you know the state may do a competitive program and say we want to ensure statewide that a certain a dollar amount gets spent in a rural area or whatever you know so there's there, there are ways to to do that within a competitive framework but i want to make sure I guess what I was asking in particular is, like you said, we get applications from the county and all the cities and from metro and we ourselves try to get some of this funding and so you know, if any of the cities were to call and say, hey, what can I do to make this grant more competitive, our staff would likely give them information. So what I'm saying is rather than wait for the city of Watsonville to contact us, can we just have staff work with the Watsonville city staff to ensure that their grant applications are competitive as possible? Yeah, staff time. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Well, in some ways, I think, you know, some of the discussion is putting the cart before the horse. I mean, the first, there's no way of getting construction funding until there's environmental and design. So I think allocating the $2 million to do the um, planning and the uh, environmental is the first step. And yeah. as that process goes on, the commission can discuss other ways that it can be supportive of getting the construction funding. That's what we've done with all the other segments. I mean, we went out and got the money to do the uh, environmental and the design. And then we went looking for grants to come and do the uh, other side. And then we looked at whether the commission has the ability to uh, provide local share, whether the city of Watsonville has the ability to pro provide the local share. We just don't know at this point, uh, but because we don't know what the project is. We have to know yeah, what the project yeah, is first sure. and what the environmental in issues are. And then um, we can be in a better position to decide how to make it happen. And I, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, for whatever it's worth, I mean, Scotts Valley doesn't really have a dog in this fight because we don't really get that much. But I had two or three phone calls from people who actually work for the county. They're very worried about, quote, future allocations, uh, you know, being given that it might harm the, you know, the ability for the county to do the job that it has to do with roads and whatever. But for whatever that's worth. Yeah, go ahead. There's no way we can appropriate money before we have anything in front of us. So all we're really doing is encouraging Watsonville to prepare itself and our, our staff to help Watsonville prepare itself for the potential of getting this kind of funding. And it's to Randy's point. It's not, we're not going to give away money today for a project. We don't know what project. I mean, we've got some rough idea, but we don't. So I, I think... It's, we're talking about encouraging that we think at this point we're to expressing our support for the idea of them moving forward. I think that's all we can do. And, 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 the, and the two million for the environmental. But we can do the environmental piece of it today. And and to confirm that those those two actions 
are not deprioritizing any funding for road projects. Is that correct? Two responses. Um, for if the, if the commission was to direct staff to prioritize funding for city of Watsonville projects, they would be as part of the consolidated grant program. So that would be the funding that the commission would be considering in fall 2025. Mm -hmm. That would be, they would be competing against projects submitted by the county, by the city that might include road projects. So there's a, a finite amount of funding. Yeah, everyone really. who oh, applies oh, for yeah. that is competing okay, against okay. So, each other, right? Yeah. But I think what we were talking about was less about prioritization mm -hmm. and more about providing staff support so that they can have a very competitive grant application. And then in the meantime, the $2 million million for the eight. I mean, that's the general what I'm hearing. And that in and of itself does not deprioritize any of the road funding Correct. at this time. Okay. And, then, and the other clarification about the Measure D active transportation funding, the action that you could take today is, is exactly what Commissioner Schifrin mentioned, which is to direct staff to bring that forward as part of the five-year plan update. We'll begin to take um, some of those recommendations about the five-year plan to our um, advisory committees in October and return to the commission November 7th. You have to hear from the public. Yeah. Sounds yeah. good. Okay. Any more comments? Yeah, go ahead, please. Commissioner Quinn. Make sure I understand. Measure D funding for trail for the North County has been pre-spent. There's nothing left for South County. No, so now we're going to prioritize looking at getting South County, which I totally support. But when you prioritize one thing, if I'm reading this correctly, what will be deprioritizing is surface road construction and other things, which we heard earlier today. The grand jury says we're in trouble. No, we're I'm I'm struggling to follow the math. I think we just confirmed we're that's if we prioritize the discretionary funding, but that's not what we're talking about. That was right part now. of the staff recommendation, that was part but of the that's staff recommendation, but it's not what yes. you're hearing you discuss right now. Yeah, but what we're discussing now is about the Measure D ATP funding, leaving the discretionary funding out of it, aside from the fact that we will provide staff support for them to apply competitively for that funding like everyone else does. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? And there is money available in the ATP for one to two million dollars for the environmental and planning. Is that not correct? Is that accurate? Um, we will. We yes, that is correct. Um, we'll have to look at what year we can program it and update the cost estimates. I think, from my perspective, the most um, next step is going to the city of Watsonville and getting their input as a. Um, the council on what alignment um, they'd like us to pursue, and then we can get updated cost estimates for the environmental. Well, the way this is worded, it's open ended, though. If you prioritize future allocations, period, it's where does it stop? We're not. Are we, let's, well, let's, me, are we going to put a limit on it then, or what? What do you mean? Like two million or five million or for EIR or, or specify? I think we said we'll, we'll return discussion. to the I commission heard. at their uh, November um, meeting with their a cost estimate and a recommendation. And so there's not a, being a commitment made today. But I think the word we're all getting hung up on is prioritize, which is trying, I am trying to remove it from the conversation and saying we're providing support, we're providing staff support and the. For us to be more competitive. More competitive. That's, you know, everyone, you know, we're, yes. uh, we're all going to compete for roads and, sure. you know, and I, and for us, we're going to be also competing for roads and, and trails. So we're in the same boat, yeah. you know, per se. But we're, and we're, also the, we're, we're, we're a, a better process because we uh, hopefully have finished or near finished the environmental report. Yes. So. The only reason for opposing this direction, and someone can validly believe that, is they really, really, really want to put this money into roads, and they don't want to put it in this trail. They want to express right now that, you know, let everybody know I'm, when it gets, when it comes before us, I don't want to have our staff help Watsonville, you know, get ready to do this kind of stuff. You could take that position. I don't take that position, but, that, but otherwise we're not committing anything, but we are saying, yeah, in a way, it, it might hurt roads a little bit to have us help Watsonville get a, a competitive application. Maybe it'll look a little better than a road project or something that could happen. But that's that's the extent of it. And if you really don't want that to happen because roads are it for you, then you should well oppose this direction that other people are expressing here. I, I, I don't I, think that's what people are saying. Like I said, I, and I, that take, might be I take offense point. at somebody saying, I'm saying one thing and wanting another or both or whatever. I've had that done before on this whole subject, and I don't appreciate it. But um, I think that if we, if we put revive or uh, reserve or 
so, uh, something that future allocations, uh, something of that nature, not not to prioritize up, up front before we know what the cost is and everything else is going on here. I would substitute the word consider for the word priority, prioritize. That'd be well accepted. I think that's really what people are saying. And then yeah. I would yes. add a direction that staff return with the five-year plan with uh, you know what the funding would be to do the environmental and design work for um, a segment 18 project but it's we need to hear yeah we still public. haven't done public that sounds super good but let's go to public comment do we have any public comment in the room hi welcome hello jenny johnson with the county of santa cruz and i am confused on the math so i apologize um what i heard director weiss just say is that this commission is already um taken all of what's left in the AT, the measure D ATP fund, its capacity, except for 10 million, to backfill the mid and north county segments. That's what I heard. Is that correct? Has this commission made that? I would say no, that's not exactly what I said. Um, but you said there was only $10 they, million dollar they, capacity. They've indicated their support. For Wait, them. hold on one second. Let's finish the public comment. And then after the public comments open, we can return to staff for okay. responses. What, what you said, I'm sorry, I don't need to put words in your mouth, but I'm confused because what you said was there $10 million capacity left, whereas the math that we got from staff at prior, our recent prior RTC meetings is that we have spent an obligated 74, 76 million, something like that, for mid and north county segments to leverage, do the environmental work pre construction and leverage the grants, which that tells me that there's 100 million left of capacity, of which we have obligated to the community that we would do 66 million, potentially we might need for maintenance, and we'll probably need another 60 to 70 for south county segment grant match local match so i'm just confused on the map and so it's a question that i think needs to be clarified um as to what we're talking about here that's all and it, maybe there won't be an answer at this moment but i'm confused and i bet you other people are too thank you any other comments in there yes welcome Good afternoon my name is murray fonts i'm assistant public works director with the city of watsonville thank you for allowing me to speak I spent the morning and mid afternoon with you. <laughs> you have our sympathy. <laughs> <laughs> we are good company. What would be ideal from my perspective for the city of Watsonville is to follow the model that some of the North County segments of the rail trail have done. They've used measure D funds to do preliminary design and environmental documents and put together a package that could then go to the state for funding through the active transportation program, therefore not reaching into RTC funds to fund the city project, but going outside, it worked for segments eight, nine, 10, and 11. It can work in Watsonville, but what we need is that infusion of one to $2 million to put together the environmental design, the environmental documents and the preliminary design the next time ATP has a cycle is in two years, in 2026. So if the funding can be allocated and it can be used by that time, the segment 18 could be advanced. So I'd ask that the commission consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Let's uh, go to our Zoom comments, and then we'll bring it back to staff to address some of the questions. Ms. Siegel? Thank you for your time. This is Fana Siegel for Friends of the Rail and Trail. We are excited to support moving forward with segment 18. This would move this rail trail segment forward um, you know, hopefully two to three years beyond what it would be uh, done otherwise. And that's always exciting for us to be able to support moving the trail faster. Um, so thank you for your support for this project. And um, we look forward to working with the community to make sure we get the, the right alignment 
Um, and I'll just thank again the staff for the new engineering that came out um, with fully protected uh, alignments for these segments. Thanks all. Lonnie Faulkner. Lonnie. Hi, thank you. Finally, the unmute came up. Um, I'm really glad to hear that the RTC will be conducting extensive outreach in Watsonville in the community on the question of segment 18. Um, as Watsonville residents must have the opportunity to express their needs and really better understand these options that are available to them. Uh, they're residents in Watsonville who've lived their entire lives in, in that community and have never had access to their local beach. Uh, a significant percentage of the residents desire to have both a rail and trail, so they have equitable access to get to work, UCSC, Cabrillo, the beaches, and other forms of important community connection. A solid 20% of our county residents do not have access to a car or even public transit to get to the beach. I support the option which meets the need of South County residents, ensuring that the trail provides Watsonville residents with access. Uh, which I th think is included in option three. And as M Mr. Murray Fontes stated, the single best way we can ensure the Watsonville city segments are competitive is to provide enough leverage so that they can be um, competitive for future ATP grants. This was done by the city of Santa Cruz as well. And um, I, I just think that's a really wise way to move forward as Mr. Fontes mentioned. Um, and then when we're planning to put this trail alongside this busy street, like in option three on Beach Street, please also consider traffic calming, street trees, traffic circles, and some of the most advanced safety designs for the Watsonville community so that kids can walk to school safely so that the um, cars and big trucks can be um, going at a safe pace for community members. Thank you so much. Ms. Steinbrunner. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? I'm just barely. Can you speak up? Okay, let me speak a little more loudly. Is this better? Yes. Thank you. Um, I I want to support also what Mr. Fontes said. He is he has been very active in the Watsonville area in the, the transportation, and I hope that you will listen to what he recommends. Um, I want to ask if there has been any consideration in um, melding with the um, the Watsonville Lee Road Trail that received funding from Cong with the help of Congressman Panetta that would link Lee Road to Pajaro Valley High School. That um, looks like it would link up with phase three of the segment 18, um, but I think that phase three should become phase one because that Lee Road Trail is funded and, and I think it looks like it's moving forward. So please consider that and also melding with the, um, co collaborating with the Caltrans project that will be putting trails and um, improvements from Highway 1 through Watsonville, Main Street downtown area, all the way out to, um, I believe it's Casserly Road past the fairgrounds on 152. So we have a great opportunity here to collaborate with these two projects. And I am encouraged to hear that South County Watsonville will be um, I know prioritized is a buzzword here that's rankling some, but they definitely need to be prioritized for funding rather than it has been in the past, the Aptos Village Project for a lot of the discretionary funds. So let's get this done and help the people, especially kids at Pajaro Valley High School. Thank you. Barry Scott. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just want to say I'm exceedingly proud of uh, uh, Commissioner Montesino for speaking up for Watsonville. Uh, I agree with everything he says, including 
uh, moving forward when the time comes, hopefully soon with the third option on Beach Street, uh, staying away from the rail corridor and moving forward. Um, I, I and I and I don't understand the confusion expressed or opposition expressed by a few of the commissioners because this motion is simply to bring it to discussion, to to bring it open. No commitment is being made to any funding. Um, so I I hope the the commission will will support Eduardo uh, Montesinos motion and that we can uh, begin to to do what what. Uh, Murray recommends, which is treat Watsonville. Already Watsonville is not getting the same treatment because they're third in line, but at least we should be treating them in the same fashion, which is to work as closely as we possibly can as we did in in uh, you know uh, in, in the city of Santa Cruz and in the North Coast sections to make sure that funding takes place. Um, uh, if the word, pri I, think the, I think it's appropriate for the word pri prioritized to be included too, but I, uh, I'm happy uh, to see it pass one way or the other. And uh, again, thank you, Commissioner Montesino. That's all. Rosemary Sarka. Uh, I'm speaking today for on behalf of Roaring Camp Big Trees and reminding the commission and the public that there is an active freight line and active customers that depend on big trees in the Watsonville area and hoping that you will consider this in determining which of the options you may choose for uh, the trail but also to remind you that the fact of freight existing in Watsonville, not only what is presently available, but the future potential has a tremendous benefit for Watsonville. Um, there's a good opportunity for jobs, uh, revenue, um, and revenue for the RTC as well uh, as, as freight there proceeds. According to the current ACL, there's a percentage available to the RTC if this, if freight there can flourish. Uh, so I am just asking uh, that you remember that freight rail is superior ecologically and efficiently uh, and environmentally to any other form of transport. Thank you. All right, seeing no further public comment, we will bring it back to the commission for any further discussion and otherwise a motion. Yes. Yeah, um, uh, but Mitch, what, uh, what the public comment brought up. Oh yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that question. <laughs> yeah, so the action the commission has taken in the past is to uh, commit to fully funding uh, segments eight through 11 through a combination of uh, federal, state, and local funds. And so the number I mentioned was if it had to be just local funds and based on the data that we had available at the time, and I don't remember when exactly that was, but we brought the, you know, essentially the same information to, to the commission a couple of times. And so in that scenario, there would be, I think the number was about 10 million available. Um, looks like Grace has the table. Maybe it has the table right there. About ten million but, available. Well, if we provided various scenarios, and Jazz, well, that scenario that you're talking about would be fifteen million, but there that would not provide funding for corridor maintenance. Um, but we have not yet programmed that funding, so maybe that's a point of clarification. Yes. But we've committed to that. We've committed to fully funding segments ten and eleven. Um, the commission has not taken action on segments eight and nine, but it would be a similar situation um, that we would bring before you as part of the cooperative agreement with the city of Santa Cruz. So that's where those numbers are coming from. Thank you. Question? Okay. Kind of does. And kind of does. <laughs> oh, oh, because, you know, um, so we're, we're, so you're prioritizing 10, 11, and 8, and 9. <laughs> And with that prioritization. At the time, we, I don't think we used the word prioritize. <laughs> I, think we, I think we said we committed to fully funding it through a combination of federal, state, and local funds. Ideally, we would get, uh, we can get federal funds to, to cover it to reduce that amount. But that was the, the action that was taken by the commission. I think if, 
excuse me. Yes. Uh, Mr. Shepard recommended review of future allocations. That that would be better than prioritize. I mean, we're we're locking. I I see prioritize as locking in the funds, and I think review would be adequate. And I think we know this commission said, including myself, that we want to pay attention to segment eighteen in Watsonville. But I think it's uh, it's better for this commission to say review the allocations. Yes, sorry, Commissioner Schifrin. A, a couple of things. One, we've used outside funding for every segment. And in fact, the, the Measure D funding has done exactly what it was supposed to do, which was, which was help leverage outside funds. So I think we have to keep that in mind in looking and thinking about future um, uh, the you know future segments, particularly in the South County. Um, also, um, I guess I, oh, I'm, I forgot what the second thing I was going to say, so I'll make a motion. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm going to move that we approve the staff recommendation with the following changes. In recommendation number three, we substitute the word consider for the word prioritize, and then we add a direction to staff to return with uh, when the um, when the uh, the uh, five year plan for Measure D funds is brought back to us with funding for um, the design and environmental work for segment 18. Second. Where do you see consider? Instead of prioritize? On, it's oh, you want consider instead of prioritize? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Consider for prioritize. Sorry. Gotcha. Who was the second? second? Okay, we have a motion and a second. You have comments, Commissioner Koenig? Sure. sure. All right. If uh, the, the maker of the motion and the second would consider the friendly amendment that was generally discussed uh, of staff providing additional assistance to uh, RTC staff providing additional assistance to the city of Watsonville staff to prepare um, uh, applications for the um, consolidated call uh, for active transportation projects. I'm happy to uh, include that, even though we're talking about 2026, I think, <laughs> but you know, I guess you can't start too early. Um, 2024 is old news. <laughs> and uh, just one question. And, and you said that you bring her back in November? Yes, so uh, right now staff will begin preparation of the draft five-year Measure D plan plans, and we will take those to our advisory committees for input in October and plan to have that before you at the November 7th RTC meeting. And let me just add, I think the, the point that was made by the um, Washington Public Works Director in terms of how the, where the likely fund, construction funds are going to come from is really important to remember because that's how we've done it in the past. And I think that's how we're going to prefer to do it in the future. So, and those are discretionary funds as well. So I think that word discretionary was confusing. Okay. Um, but I think the intent is to go after funds. Uh, first priority would be to go after funds that are really allocated for this, these kinds of projects. Oh, I know what the other thing I was going to talk about <laughs> is that I really think the commission needs to look more seriously at the whole notion of whether we want to spend our very limited measure D funds uh, on maintenance. And, you know, I think uh, I've talked in the past about the jurisdictions that the uh, rail is going through making larger contributions, but I'm going to really jump out and say, I think we should consider that we should we could spend some TDA funds to maintain our property, and the rail trail is the commission's property. The rail line is the commission's property, and uh, when we produce this, uh, as we go through this very difficult process of producing it, it, I don't think it's unreasonable to use TDA funds uh, that are more flexible to at least we should consider that it's not appropriate at this time but i did want to mention it all right commissioner montesino yeah and like i said that's a that's a whole different other conversation about you know but we should we should talk about it so you know it either moves forward or it doesn't you know um because you know there's a, a lot of competing you know interests in, in all that conversation 
Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor, say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Wonderful. Thank you. Um, that brings us now to a review of items to be discussed in closed session. We will be having a conference with our labor negotiators. Um, we will take a short break for... Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes. Public comment on our closed session items. Thank you. Sorry to keep you guys yeah. from lunch and uh, an exciting another closed session. Um, on behalf of the core, I did want to just share before you go into closed session to discuss the org assessment, a few comments from our staff. Um, first off, we want to reiterate our appreciation for your approval of item 20, which added additional core staff to the agency will, which will help us address some workload burnout and other issues. So thank you again for that. However, we do want to reiterate our concern about the growth of the, the pro, proposed, proposed expansion of the management team. Um, as discussed many times during this meeting, there are limited dollars and we have a lot of needs in our community. And we're worried about the sticker price using uh, Commissioner Johnson's term uh, words about for these three new director salaries and benefits. Um, adding these new directors is expensive. It will limit the funding available for more um, non-management staff. And it will also impact the delivery of RTC, Santa Cruz, Metro, and local agency transportation projects, programs, and services that are priorities for our community. At a minimum, we ask that it be made clear to any new directors or managers that we cannot afford managers who only oversee the work of others. RTC needs directors and managers who understand they need to roll up their sleeves, um, mentor staff, provide leadership, but also produce deliverables themselves like staff reports. We have a lot of work for them to do. So thank you for that. Thank you. Any further public comment? Any online? Okay, uh, with that, we will go to our closed session and return for a report out, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. All right, we, I have returned from our closed session. Uh, can we have a report out on closed session? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The commission uh, ended the closed session. There is no reportable action from closed session today. Great. Thank you. With that, well, we will re uh, adjourn until our next meeting on October 3rd. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you so much.